you <laughs> bought the gun illegally. You are holding a a permitless gun. You're yeah. committing a crime. No Correct. one knows about it yet, but if they do, yeah. you're in trouble. Yeah. That's, That's the what, same the same way the mom can sent the mom is talk like if you correct, even correct. Found, wait 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 billy i let's let's just extend this analogy just like a tiny bit just yeah. like zoom out like a millimeter you, on this analogy okay wait you wait, filed wait, off wait, the wait, cereal wait, shut wait, up wait and we're back it is Thursday, October 26th, it's macrodosing. Today's episode is going to be a good one. Today's episode is going to be about interrogations, confessions, false confessions, um, tactics that uh, that police, military use when they're interrogating people, and uh, yeah, just psychological pressure in general. So we're back. It's also Halloween weekend coming up, spooky season, and so we would like to do an annual tradition here on macrodosing, and that is play... Arian and his kids smash Halloween hit knock knock. Can we play right now? Can we put it into the yeah. show? Yeah, put it in the show. It's a bop. Yeah, it's a bop, man. I ain't going to lie. It's one of the better Halloween songs that there is. Dope, I agree. Man. It should be it should be, the, should be the trick-or-treating theme. You know what I mean? It's your fire, bro. Yeah. So if you got kids or even if you don't, play that video for them. Yeah. Uh, so great, it's going. Great song. It's, hopefully it drops on Friday. And then it'll be available on the Macrodosa YouTube, the video. Um, and then on Saturday, I'm, I'm hoping we can get the... Uh, Get it on all like you know Spotify and all that stuff. So, okay, so it'll be we'll have a little clip of that video during this episode, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the full one's coming out on Friday, and then on streaming platforms this weekend. Yep, yep, and we'll perfect. Be, uh, all right, you know, doing all socials so y'all can keep up with it if you follow socials. What are the Halloween uh, costumes this year? People know what they're getting dressed up as. I don't know yet. Um. I, it's gonna be last minute because I hadn't thought about it, but uh, I don't know what y'all got. I might do Top Gun. I might just be a pilot. Love that. Yeah, like you already got a jacket, don't you? That's the easy money. Yeah, I got the bomber jacket. <laughs> I want to be a pink gorilla. Okay. What's what's down the... in Austin, Texas, for the Pink Whitney tour? Oh, love it. Check love us it. out. Where are you going? Oh, we're we're. Uh, let me check. I think you're going to the bit parlor yard. It's the Bills Bar. There, oh, sweet. Think, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, so that's where I'm headed. <laughs> parlor Yard. Yep, Friday, October 27th at 9 p.m. I'll be at the Parlor and Yard. Come by for some free Pink Whitney shots and be able to spend some time with uh, Tommy, Rudy, and I as we uh, spread the love of Pink Whitney. Okay, Parlor. I'm looking this up right now. I don't know if I've ever been to the Parlor and Yard. It might have been something different when I was there. It's a good location, though. So go check it out, Sixth Street. Have a I'm blast! I'm pumped Billy. to see Malik Murphy play. Yeah, so of, yeah, yeah. I I, I want to talk about that because uh, Quinn Ewers is out, right? Malik Murphy is the backup to Quinn Ewers. If, I still listen to a lot of Austin sports talk. Uh, keep up with the Longhorns a little bit, and Malik Murphy this off season, everybody was talking about how good that guy can be, and he's huge. He's like a fucking monster of a quarterback. Unit. He's a unit, I, and I guess in the spring game he looked real good. And everyone's talking about Arch Manning, and obviously Arch Manning is going to be the future of Texas at quarterback. But this weekend, if Malik Murphy plays, this is this is his audition for the transfer window. I mean, unfortunately, this is going to be his make or break because because he has a Manning behind him. If he plays badly, 
like no booster is going to want to hear about him unless he's sick. They want to have Manning getting all the second string reps. But uh, I clickbaited some people by saying Sarkeesian said that uh, Manning would be like ready to go. Uh, but that just means he's QB2, not QB1. So hopefully the best case scenario for both quarterbacks is that Malik Murphy has some amazing stats. They blow uh, they blow out BYU and then um, – Arch gets in late and then just like get some garbage time reps and looks good. Well, and I think everyone's happy. I think what's going to happen is if Malik Murphy plays well, then he'll, he'll have a great opportunity next year to transfer to a team where he can start immediately. Cause I don't think that Texas is going to start him. If they've got Arch Manning, they're going to go with Arch eventually. I don't think, I don't think Arch is to be honest that ready. Yeah. But by next year is what I'm saying. I, I don't even know about next year. Talk about PFT. You a Texas Longhorns fan? I would so I lived in Austin for nine years, right? And when I was down there, I followed the team. I'm not I'm not a fan, but I I am intrigued by the situation surrounding Texas football. <laughs> what is that? Because it's like po- it, it's like Succession. It's like Game of Thrones shit that goes on down in Austin. You've got probably six or seven billionaires that think that they run the program, and they're always fighting with each other about coaches, coaching buyouts. Um, there's a lot of stuff that happens around that university. That's not like the football team. If you're going to coach Texas football, you either have to have a big enough ego and a big enough personality to keep these guys in check. And Putin. To pre- yeah. You have to be Putin to prevent them from like taking over your program, or you can be like what Mac Brown did. And he, he managed it pretty well for a while, which is just be so friendly to everybody while also knowing how to navigate everyone's wants and needs, all the big boosters that uh, you can skate by for a while and make everybody feel good about themselves. Um, so even if you're winning in Texas, you're going to get some of the boosters pissed off because you're doing stuff that they don't want and they don't feel like they're getting their money's worth. It's um, it's like it's Shakespearean almost. So it's, the, it's the sports re- reality TV that you, you, and you enjoy the show. Yeah, I, j- I really enjoy the show. And like tr- it, the conspiracy theories that you can put out around Texas football are always incredible because you've got so many power players down there that you can connect all these dots and really turn a story into whatever you want it to be. But um, I'm, sports, I'm, sports really is like dudes gossip shit. Like it's really, yeah. it's really college is, football bro. in particular. Yeah. They, need to, wow. they got to do a real housewives, but it's all college coaches wives. I would watch <laughs> that show. I mean, if they did like, doesn't Big Brother have like four episodes a week or something? I'd watch four episodes a week of that. Oh, for sure. And they're all it's it's all like Miss Terry, Miss June, who's Miss June? Miss Adam. Uh, or, I'm just making up. Just he's making, he's making an old white lady name. Well, Miss Terry <laughs> is real. Miss Terry from Friday Night Lights. Miss Terry no, is Miss Terry is Saban. Oh, oh. Wife. Hmm. no, Miss June just sounds like she would be a the wife in Friday Night. The uh, that's Tammy Taylor in Friday. That's actually uh, my uh, grandma's name. Rest in peace, John. Oh yeah. R.I.P. Yeah. June. June. R.I.P. June. But yeah, the uh, the situation surrounding Texas football is always just fascinating to me. It's not. I don't really root for Texas. I like to see them relevant. I think it's cool. It's good for college football, and it's always interesting. So, uh, but I, I'm not like a Texas Longhorns fan or anything. I do love the tailgate scene though. Some sick tailgate. We got a tailgate Austin. together, bro. Yeah. Because we have I never agree. tailgated, have we? Austin. We- this we Saturday. stopped. We stopped by Knoxville for a little bit. Yeah, I couldn't. I'm sorry, man. I couldn't. That's no, okay. Yeah. But um, no, nah, we should set it up. Let's pick a random college to go to and hit it up. Yeah, Northwestern. Well, I was gonna say let's go to like a that, Northwestern yeah. game and just yeah. do it up. Yeah, I'm I wanted to go to because the... I've never been to a game up north at all. Actually, because when I played, we all played like you know Southern State or West Coast. I don't think I ever played. Not like Ohio, Notre Dame, Michigan. Notre Dame. Oh, I, I lied. I did play one game in, in Notre Dame. I'm I'm tailgating in Madison this weekend. Are you going up there for that? Mm-hmm. That's gonna be fun. Mm-hmm. It's gonna be a great time. Uh, I wanted to go to the Howard Northwestern tailgate on October seventh. <laughs> that would have been so much fun to go to. Northwestern? Do they even tailgate there? I can't imagine. I mean, half they the study. season it's too cold, and it's also at like eleven a.m. Yeah, they play every game at eleven, so you've got to get there at seven. Yeah. They're busy studying, yeah. I'm sure that there's some tailgating scene at Northwestern. They probably wear ties. They play at uh, Wrigley this week, I think. Oh, really? I think they're playing... Who is it? I forget, but I believe it's at Wrigley Field. I might have to check that out. Speaking of the Big Ten, we got to talk about this Michigan manifesto. 600 pages by this dude that he wrote about the future 
of Michigan. Connor Stallions. That's insane. I mean, anyone who writes 600 pages about anything, uh, like not for their job, like is recreational, that's dangerous. The Apostles? <laughs> I, of nice I don't believe still, they, they still agree called with it here. a manifesto themselves. <laughs> yeah. I'm agreeing with Billy here. Cook, man. <laughs> I mean, that's like a pre crime. That's 100% a pre crime. Like, this guy's probably like sending anthrax to like opposing quarterbacks. Like, that's probably what's in the manifesto. This is one of my favorite stories in the history of college football. Also, I so I have a theory on this. Okay. Um, okay. So it comes out yesterday that not only was this guy doing this for Big Ten games, Michigan had scouted the last two SEC championship games. And then last year they went to Tennessee against Kentucky after Tennessee beat Alabama and was top five in the country. Looked like a college football playoff contender. They went to Clemson and there was one other college football playoff contender. It wasn't a TCU. I forget who it was. Um, but so then after that happens, um, South Carolina, which had looked like, a pile of shit for the entire season beats the hell out of Tennessee and goes on the road and beats Clemson, knocking both of those teams out of the college football playoff. Generally, generally teams who have looked mid to bad for 10 games. Don't beat two top five teams back to back weeks. Yeah. Most of the time. Okay. So what if, uh, Michigan had the signals of both Tennessee and Clemson teams that they had gone to these games and filmed the sideline. Sees, oh, so we could send these to South Carolina. They're playing both of them. Knock them both out, and now we get somebody like TCU, who in theory is an inferior opponent, even though TCU ended up beating them. Uh, I'm just saying. Also, Shane Beamer, when he was at Georgia, was fined by the university for his time at Virginia Tech uh, taking information about uh, Wake Forest game plan. Huh. Big T, I, I love this theory. Mm. And I also <laughs> love how college football it is because Big T is just retroactively trying to figure out how well, could, well, how could South Carolina have beaten us last year. I'm just – generally, teams <laughs> yeah. that I believe they were 6-4 and four at the time mm -hmm. don't beat two top five teams two weeks in a row. That's interesting. So we now we need to find a connection between Connor Stallions and the University of South Carolina. What is yeah, what's wait, the common thread? Well, there? this guy seems to have Where a paper trail everywhere else. So yeah. I'm sure there's it's somewhere. I like this theory, Big T. Also, as you saw, uh, this story was broken on VolQuest a year ago. Yeah. So I, I, I said on part of my take yesterday, before this information came out, I think Andy Staples put it out there, uh, that really it's an indictment of college football fan message boards. The fact that this story didn't come out until just now, because this message boards are they're the one place on earth where you would think this type of story would have some legs before it makes it to the mainstream media. Right. Because on college football message boards, you get all these insane theories. You get every crackpot, every diehard super fan throwing everything out there, trying to explain anything away. And the fact that Connor stallions was not identified or not the, the cheating scandal was not um, initially uncovered on a message board raised a lot of red flags for me. It turns out that, VolQuest, Tennessee's football program's message board, they were on this. They had they were talking about how this guy was going to all these games. Um, there was a picture that was taken from um, I forget what game it was. He Connor Stallings. They went to the Kentucky game, and so there was a, a guy that was sitting behind him taking pictures of him while he was videotaping the sidelines. I haven't seen that. Yeah, there's a, one of those one of those pictures came out. It might have been at a different game, but the message boards had it. The message boards yeah. did have it. We just didn't listen. On January 17th, 2023, VolQuest user Arnie Palmy Alert. Shout out the other guys. That's a great username. Uh, no clue if related, but I posted on here a couple months ago about a mutual friend of mine that was working for Michigan, going to other schools, games, stealing plays. They'd pay his flights, lodging, food, and seats right behind that team's bench for him to get video notes, etc. Uh, you can check my history to confirm if you want. Guy had tickets to our game at Vandy as they'd already paid for his stuff, thinking they'd see us in the playoffs before we lost to South Carolina. So I, I, according to this guy, they also had tickets to the Vandy game, but it was confirmed that someone went to the Tennessee Kentucky game, uh, and was filming Tennessee's sideline. 
it's a great story. And I think Billy's right. Anytime you write a manifesto about something, big, big red flag. 600 pages. <laughs> but I'm going to be honest. Besides the manifesto, like once the manifesto thing came out, I was like, oh, shit, that's that's bad. I think we've said on the show manifestos equals automatically bad. There's no good manifesto. Mm-hmm. But I think the whole Stein, sign stealing stuff isn't like – if teams aren't making sure that they're changing their signs and taking adequate, you know, responsibility to make sure that their codes can't be cracked, I mean that's on them. I mean, even I, at the low at the lowest levels of football are codes changed week in, week out. Like high school D three, I was a signal caller in D three. We had to make sure that our codes were changed, dummy signals to have some sort of like the whole point, it's a code and signs is so that other people can't crack it. If you're going to put them out there for everyone to see, there is a chance you get your stuff looked at. And if you're not taking adequate responsibility to make sure your stuff isn't getting cracked, that's on you. And to be honest, there's enough media out there nowadays to see signals being done in every game, be it through uh, broadcasting. Like You can piece together signals if you want to. Like The thing is, yes, they were filming sidelines. But that those signs and seeing all that stuff in like succession is pretty easy to see in other forms of media. Mm-hmm. So yes, it's less work, but it's not like you can't find it. The coaches who have talked about it seem to think this is the most egregious thing you could possibly do. Do they? Yes. There's an article in The Athletic today that talked to five head coaches and they all said they've never heard of anyone doing anything this egregious. Well, I, the ESPN one was saying that Everyone, like a lot of coaches in the Big Ten were like, yeah, shit happens. Yes. I I tend to believe that at big time programs, this type of shit has happened before. I also think that this Connor Stallions kid sounds like a real go-getter to me. He's He he had this all planned out. He's been thinking about uh, changing Michigan football and coaching Michigan football obsessively since he was like 12 years old. He's uh, He found his way into the program by befriending coaches and members of the uh, of the athletic staff, and he's been presenting to them evidence of like proving his worth. Uh, this kid, if he okay, okay, here's the thing: manifestos always bad. I disagree. But, I'm just reading about this, but we'll get back to it later. Finish your point. Manifestos always bad. This type of psycho obsessive behavior bad. But I'm yeah. very glad that Connor Stallions is channeling his energy into college football instead of something far more destructive that he could be doing. Like if you're going to be a psycho about some shit, be a psycho and, and, and just be hyper-focused on Michigan football. That's great. Like we should be applauding this kid for choosing a, a productive path forward for himself instead of getting dragged into weird parts of the internet, weird side movements and shit. I'm, I think we really dodged a bullet. The fact that Connor Stallions just cares so much about Michigan football and not about some other weird stuff that he could have cared about. This is the definition of weaponized passion and intelligence. You wanted to say autism. I didn't though. We don't, we don't, we don't know. We can't, we, yeah. I, I also feel like people talk about autism has gotten like people way overuse it, way overuse it right now. We have no idea yeah. what this kid's uh, mental makeup is, his background, whether or not he's on any sort of spectrum. Um, but I do think that he is—he uh, had a very high potential to cause a lot of damage with a with a mental makeup like this. Yes, and he's at least using it for something constructive. So I think I think we should all take a big deep breath and thank our lucky stars that he is a uh, just obsessed with making the Michigan Wolverines as great of a program as he can. Could be your He co-worker. might be our coworker. Oh, jinx. yeah. Yeah, Dave has offered him a job. I would I would, hell I want this guy on my side. Yeah. I just want to read the manifesto. I'd pay Same. good money to read the Michigan manifesto. I and I don't read for pleasure. I'd read all 600 pages. Yeah. <laughs> he should blog it if he becomes our coworker. Yeah. And let's just be realistic. I've put together fact sheets and prep sheets that like look really long, but really there's just like a lot of like space between the paragraphs, double space, like graphics and stuff in it. Like for all, like there may be about like a hundred pages of just pictures of different plays. It might not just be 600 pages of straight writing. Mm-hmm. That would still be insane. <laughs> yeah. Like when I'm like, I put together a 30 page fact sheet. Facts are there's a lot of pictures in it. Pictures? Yeah. 
I, I was a thousand words, man. <laughs> do you think that like Alabama's done stuff like this in the past? Absolutely. I mean, every team is certainly trying to get an edge. To what extent, I you know, I don't know. But it sounds like this is the first time anyone has been this brazen, at least in this particular act. Yeah. Yes, it's brazen. It wasn't guarded that well. Apparently, going back the last couple of years, other coaches knew that this was happening to the point where one coach confronted this guy about it and said, like, we know what you're doing. And it's fucked up. Um it wouldn't shock me if, if other teams were doing similar things to this, but this guy was just yeah, okay. A couple of things. His opsec needs a little bit of work. Operational security for sure. Not good. You do this in cash. You get petty cash for this. Um, you also he, apparently he was wearing like neutral colors to every game, not cheering, just videotaping. Well, he wasn't going to most of them. He, I know he went to a couple of them. But yeah, he, but most of them, they had a an operation where he was buying the tickets, forwarding them to someone else under his own name. Yeah. And then that person went and filmed the sideline the entire game. Okay, so that's bad. You got to spread the receipts out a little bit. Yes. And then the people that go to the games, you have you have to have them dressed up as a home team fan. That's what you need to do because then they would blend in. Nobody would think anything about it. So you have to have different, you have to go in camo. You have to have different uniforms for different stadiums that you're breaching. And uh, you have to make sure that there's no Venmo transactions out there. The Venmo is insane. Yeah. And he was also apparently bragging to people about it, which is how the message boards found out about it. Uh, you got to, you got to keep your mouth shut about this. Got to keep your mouth shut. Yeah. He's very they? proud. Were they also military members? Was there something that like he was buying the tickets for people he, in the military that were like his friends who were doing the filming? I don't know about that. He was in the yeah. military though. Yeah. yeah. Also, just bring back the huddle. If you're so concerned about your signs getting st stolen, just like run a huddle. If they were so screwed up and like so based off of the signs, just go old school. Like the huddle was the most secure way to like convey plays onto the field. If you think about it, face I know it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I was thinking about it. Like we've strayed so far from the huddle that huddle we is, now have. Huddle is definitely like, not gone. What are you talking about? Well, I would say in the, in the, in like, college, why we have signs in college. Yeah. Still not gone. Um, I mean, still not gone. I mean, I've seen the huddles. I've watched college football this year. Right. But you, it is more, it is less prevalent, but it's just because yeah. of fast paced offense, which I'm not a fan of, but, but we've, we've gotten to the point where literally we're doing so much that people can find your, like, it's gone to this point. Also, I believe that's slowing down as well. Like if the college football I'm watching, the pace is getting slower than what it was. I would say like three or four years ago, in my opinion, is a reaction to the, the hyper fast offense. No, I think football just goes through phases. Like right now, the college football phase is probably, you know, and I don't know the data on that, obviously, but like just from what I saw, I, I, didn't, I didn't watch a lot of college football last three, four years, but the few games that I have watched this year, it doesn't look to seem to be as fat. Like the, the emphasis is not there. They still have it, but it's just not as fast as it was. I yeah, I, I, I think if you go full huddle, that would ob obviously affect how your offense is run, especially if you're trying to run a, a fast pace. If that's like the advantage that you have um, with the way that your team's set up, then going huddle would be a disadvantage, but you got to switch up your signals. You got to, I know they put like uh, tarps over the guys that are making the signals on the sidelines sometimes, but you can still see that from the opposite side of the field, obviously. So if you have a guy on the opposite side filming, you can figure it out. Uh, it is a great story though. It is just, it's fantastic. And I, I don't see how, um, Harbaugh didn't know about it unless he had very strict orders. If he, if he told his assistants, like if you're doing anything shady, I don't want to know about it. Well, this, the manifesto is the best thing that ever happened to him because yeah. now they can say, look at this whack job. He would have done anything to be part of Michigan. We have, we had no idea he was doing this. Now you can look at the videos of him on the sideline, standing right next to the offensive and defensive coordinators and Harbaugh with laminated sheets of guys making signals on them. Yep and make a different argument but uh the the manifesto was probably good news for harbaugh yeah i have to say harbaugh's gonna love that yeah. by the way like yes it's gonna it's gonna insulate him a little bit the fact that this guy seems to be a psycho but at the end of the day harbaugh is like hey kid you done good like i respect harbaugh respects a man with a manifesto oh yeah for sure i i think that this may have been a lazy move by him 
he may have like his job for the team may have been, yeah, pick up the signs through any of the tape. If you like pick anything up, because like that used to be a thing when watching tape as a quarterback, like even in high school, you try to see the defensive signals to get a better judge of what defense they were playing. So like it used to be easy as fuck, like defensive coordinators would put up two fists and be like, oh, it's cover two. And that would help you like read better. But he, that could have been his job just to note it down in film. But then he was like, yo, I'll buy you a GA ticket if you just go film the sideline and make my job so much easier. Yeah, I wouldn't, say, this, I, I wouldn't say it's lazy. I'd say that it's way more work that he was doing. Efficient. He was he was like putting the the hard hours into He's it. running an operation. He was, yeah. He, he was treating it like it is the military. But nobody, I don't think anybody that's not a Michigan fan, believes this guy that was making 55 grand a year was buying tickets to all these games from his own money paying for people to go yeah. uh, i mean that uh, that just wasn't happening i agree i would agree with that i would also think that that hardball would probably be gone after this year depending on what happens i think this makes it infinitely more likely he goes to the nfl yeah and when he goes to the nfl he's probably going to hire Connor stallions that'd be awesome yeah he should like this this kid has proven to you that he will do anything and he's he shows initiative he's a complete psychopath but he shows initiative he gets results more importantly he under he was telling his um like people that wanted to work for him he was saying you have to bring an idea to the coaching staff and it has to be one of three things i think it has to be like useful uh straightforward and then um like um, you you have to be able to apply it immediately i think those were the three things he's like if it's not those three things don't bring it to me. He like correctly identified what coaches want, what's useful to them, went out on his own, cheated his dick off. Uh, and I think that Harbaugh would see a guy like that and be like, this is, this is a guy I can grow old with in the NFL. This is going to be his Ernie Adams to Bill Belichick. Like th whatever team these two guys are going to go to next in the NFL, I'm going to bet on them because there's no length to which they won't go to win a football game, which is, that's ideally what you would like as a head coach. Do you think that, uh, do you think in the NFL, this is like a common practice and we just don't know? Uh, I think in the NFL, it could be because think about it. I think, it I could mean, be. they do. I don't think they do much signage in the NFL offensively because the quarterback has a mic in his head yeah, in his helmet no signals. But maybe defensively do line. Does the middle linebacker yes, have a yeah. there's one Green on dot. each side? Yeah. Yeah. So Which is what there should be in college, by the way. Yeah, that is the solution to all of this. I think there there's definitely elements of bending the rules and cheating that goes on in the NFL and competitive advantages that are gained that are not strictly above board. I think that happens on almost every team. Almost every team. Because if you think about the salaries the coaching staff gets paid, they like, if you're a coach in the NFL, yeah, you get paid a, a fuckload of money. I don't know what the average coaching salary would be, but my guess is anywhere between $3 million and Belichick probably gets $20 million a year, right? So Does he really? Does he really? Yeah, I think so. But the, Don't the they not disclose that? They don't, they don't have to disclose it, but that's, that's just a wide bullshit. general guess. So they're getting a bunch of money to be coaches, um, knowing that if they don't produce, they'll be fired. They'll lose their income. And they'll probably have to move their families across the country. Damn, it is 20. Yeah, yeah. That's what Hank was saying the other day. I couldn't believe it. It's crazy, that, right? That is wild. Dog. He what's, makes double what Saban makes? What's his uh what's his what's his record? What's his record without without T V twelve? It's a great question, Aaron. It's not not that good. Interesting. Uh but yeah, so if you put yourself in these guys' shoes, every season you have the threat of losing your job. And you have the threat of having to move your families to some other city, become an assistant, um, whatever the case may be. You do not want to do that. You want to keep your families where they are and you want to stay employed. You will do anything that it takes to make sure that that happens, including cheating, finding new ways to cheat. And uh, it, it would not shock me at all if this happened on like in some way or form on most teams in the NFL. Now, granted, they were pretty brazen about it. College football is different. Probably doesn't happen because you don't have all the resources on every campus. Like Michigan probably has some money flowing through it. They won't bat an eye if you're paying for an assistant to you know, take a trip to West Lafayette once a season. But uh, it happens in the NFL. Probably not as much in college. I do think to the, to the point of 
is this a big deal or not? Generally in college football, if you are cheating in a way that most schools are cheating, you're not going to get ratted out for it because it's a glass house situation. Yes. Tennessee was paying recruits all sorts of stuff, being dumb as hell and pretty brazen about it. And it only came out because they tattled on themselves to get rid of paying, to get out paying Jeremy Pruitt a buyout. Schools won't because they're doing the same thing. It seems like the rest of the schools are pissed about this because they're not doing anything close to this, mm -hmm. which is why it's come out. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. I think some schools are, are doing things that are similar, but the vast, vast majority probably are not. Anything you can pick up in a game or like on tape that's just available to all the teams, like that's fair game. Yeah. This is obviously very different. Yeah. And I mean, Har it's very funny. It's a very uniquely Harbaugh situation that he's found himself into. Yeah. he's If you were to say which NCAA coach is running a massive spy ring, uh, to improve their team's likelihood for success, Harbaugh would be minus 150. He'd Kirby would have been my first choice, uh, but then he, he's up there for sure. Kirby had a great line too. Yeah, I th I was hoping he was – I watched the video of it. He w he was just being coach speak. He wasn't saying it like to be funny, but it was funny. Yeah, it was, Spurrier would have said yes. it but meant it yes. like as a joke. They asked Kirby Smart about uh, what he thinks about the scandal, and Kirby was like, well, I didn't see a whole lot of competitive advantage that they gained against us. So um, yeah, He said, like, there was nothing that would lead me to believe that that was an issue. Yeah. So that's it's a great scandal. And so I would like to know, Big T, from your perspective, because college sports turns us all into these weird tribal – it's interesting to see like the psychology as a team gets accused of doing something wrong. We saw it with Alabama and their basketball team last year, how all of a sudden um, Tide fans became experts in criminal law mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> and like cases of firearm discharges and things like yeah. that. You you develop like you get really down into the weeds if it's a member of the team that you root for that that would support it. If it was if it was the Volunteers, if it was Tennessee that had this massive ring of uh, like going to every SEC stadium. They sent an operative out there. What would your reaction be to that? How would you get yourself out of that um, cognitive dissonance mentally? I mean, if you're a Michigan fan, you should be saying what Dave is saying, which is like, we just kick everybody's ass and y'all are mad about it. Obviously, it seems like something nefarious was going on, but like, yeah, if you're a Michigan fan, obviously you'd just be like, to their credit, they've cheated and won. There are plenty of teams who cheat and don't have the levels of success Michigan has had. Yep. Um. So you just say, like, fuck it, prove it. Yeah. And it seems, I mean, there's a real, what I'm honestly rooting for, just because I love chaos, <laughs> is Michigan to win the national title yes, this year. 100%. Because that'd be hysterical. <laughs> yes, that'd be the funniest outcome. And it seems like there's really nothing... The NCAA for sure cannot act that quickly. Maybe the Big Ten could say you can't participate in the Big Ten championship game. I've seen that floated out there. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, so they could go 15-0, win the national title. That'd be hysterical. Michigan JMU. <laughs> Who says no? That'd be awesome, actually. Michigan yeah. gets banned from the postseason, and, yeah. and thirteen or 12-0 Michigan plays 12-0 JMU. For the national championship. <laughs> That'd be pretty sick. Yeah, let's let's make that happen. I bet you I could convince Dave to make that game happen. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. 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 Easily. Let's, okay, now I'm excited. <laughs> although although the, the funniest version, you're right, Big T, the funniest by far would be if Michigan won the national championship <laughs> and then their program got like suspended for three years and Harbaugh yeah. dances away to the NFL right after the season's <laughs> over. Oh, he's gone. Yeah. I think 100%. Yeah, there's just there's too much right. He's too hot right now. Um, but yeah, to your point, at least they're cheating and winning. I yeah, I mean, that. they're winning a ton of games. I So if I were a Michigan fan, what I would say is – uh, I would turn this as an entire indictment on the NCAA. I'd be like, the NCAA is a corrupt organization. Who are they to tell us what we can and can't do? They're just trying to make money off the backs of our student athletes. We're trying to take care of them the best that we can and doing the best for our students here at Michigan. And the NCAA is coming in with their uh, tyrannical rules that they're trying to impose on everybody. Give me liberty or give me death. Let me do what I want to do with my program. NCAA has no right to take ownership of college sports they've proven time and time again that they're a corrupt organization that does not have the best interests of the students at heart so if we were breaking a law we we're breaking a law imposed by an unjust system and we're freedom fighters 
That's what I would say. The thing about the NCAA is everybody says they hate the NCAA and fans do. The schools pretend they do. The NCAA is just the schools. Yeah. They could all dissolve it immediately if they wanted to. Everybody, they all like the NCAA until it comes for them. Yeah. So the NCAA is just the schools. But that's, that's in my opinion, the best path out of this for Michigan is it fans. Though? It's, is like a, what? it's like a separate entity that they all just chose to be a part of. So it's not necessarily... The schools give the NCAA its power. They could all break off today if they wanted to. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. It, it's you. like the NFL where all the teams are in conjunction and Roger Goodell represents the NFL, but really it's just all the owners together and they elect this guy to represent them. So that way each team is like protected in their own right. When I just found out he gets lifetime health care. Goodell does? Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Oh my God. Fuck it. Fuck that. Are you serious? Yeah, it's crazy. Well, what do you think is more taxing on the body? Playing football or being the commissioner of football? Probably being the commissioner, honestly. I can only imagine the <laughs> amount of stress it puts on the body getting $40 million a year. <laughs> yeah, just to wear a suit and to speak gibberish. It's got to be tough. He got signed to an extension, right? Yep. Hmm. How you how you get that job, bro? You know what I'm saying? How you get that job? Nepotism. No, no well question, connected. but like... You're going to be part of the deep state. The deep state of the NFL. Well, his his father may have been part of the real deep state. His dad was a senator, yeah. Like what was what are the qualifications to, to being a NFL company? Like, like what, what, are, what do you have to know? You have to be able to, to um, be the bad guy and be okay with being the bad guy. So you get a lot of shit from the media, from the fans... On one side, then behind the scenes, you get a lot of shit from the owners and you have to do the owner's bidding and then take all that punishment from the fans on the other side of it. So if you're OK doing that, you have to be able to speak a lot without really saying anything. And um, yeah, that's, that's basically that's the job description. From what I see, it's a lot like being a CEO, the the process for becoming a CEO of a company. So but the board is all the owners. So his time at the New York Jets is where he started, uh, where he oversaw operations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he, so he was the head of the AFC. He worked out his way up the back office's ranks, and then the board of owners chose him. They're like, this guy will be able to play ball. <laughs> yeah, he's op- <laughs> basically his venture financing and his establishment of the NFL network were the two big things that got him the job. So, yeah, it's a sweet gig if you can get it, being the commissioner of anything. Right, so, that's uh, yeah, that's uh, that's Michigan That's Michigan talk for I you. love this story. I, I just want it to keep going forever. I need you to find a connection between the Gamecocks and it, Connor it, it exists somewhere. I mean, this guy leaves a paper trail everywhere he goes. I so need you to it's f- out there. Big T, this would, this would be huge. Yeah. I, I like need this theory. guy. They did not score an Kenya. offensive point the week, the week before before Tennessee. Interesting. Then they scored nine touchdowns. Very interesting. Just saying. Teams, a lot of a lot of the time, doesn't happen like that. Mm-hmm. We, well, so it was against Tennessee, then Clemson, right? Mm-hmm. Hmm. And they wanted to play TCU in the college football playoff. I think they wanted to play, uh, just get as many teams out of the way as they could. It didn't really work out for them. Though. No, it did not. But they did score a lot of points against TCU. And they did. I think they had some costly turnovers inside the 10 yard line against TCU. Yep. First possession, I think. Yeah. So that that game could have gone the other way for sure. Yeah. They scored a ton of points. All right. I like this theory. I like this theory a lot. I'd like you to dig into it a little bit more. Uh, All right. So what else we got before we hop into interrogations? Did you see that Alaska air story? I did see that, yeah. As a as a pilot, PFT, what are your thoughts? As a pilot, uh, the Alaska Air story is that there was a uh, a pilot for Alaska Air that was taking a flight. He was not a member of the crew on this flight. He was in the jump seat. Sometimes pilots can do that for airlines. They'll get into the cockpit. And they'll take like a free flight, especially if they have um, if they have another route that they have to actually pilot the next day. 
they'll get a free flight to wherever that city is. Then they can get on their plane that they're flying and take off from there. So there's a pilot that was in the cockpit. He was not a member, member of the crew, but he d was an employee of Alaska Air. And at some point during the flight, he snapped and he reached over and he tried to shut down the engines of the flight as it was in midair in the cockpit. They restrained him. They took him out of the cockpit. They handcuffed him. I didn't know that that airplanes had handcuffs on board. They yeah, got, got marshals. Yeah, they got marshals. But I don't think that there's a marshal on every single flight. Nah, I guess it's kind of like random, but good thing there was one on that one. Yeah, somebody had handcuffs at least. And so this guy got handcuffed in the back of the plane, stopped causing a scene, and they had to radio down to down to the airport and say, hey, we got to land. We've had a, uh, a level four incident in the cockpit, which I, I researched. It's called a level four. Level four is um, breach of the co breach of the cockpit, immediate danger to everybody on board. So um, I think level one is like verbally abusive passenger. Level two is physically abusive passenger. Level three is like attempted hijacking or something like that. And then level four is they actually do breach the cockpit and get in there and the plane's in danger. So. Mm. Is a level four. From what I read, he tried to use the engine fire extinguisher, um, which would shut down the engines. And for whatever reason, he wasn't able to turn that on or activate it, and they got him out of there. But yeah, that it could have been bad. It could have been real bad. Although you can, depending how high the plane was, how fast it was going, there have been circumstances where a plane has lost all their engines, and it turns into a big glider at that point where it uses the airspeed that it has, and there's like an equation that they put in to see how many miles to the nearest airport versus how many feet above the ground are we right now. And they can calculate their distance that they're able to travel once they put the airplane into like the most aerodynamic configuration and they can figure out the closest airport to land at. Um, so it's possible. It's not easy to do, but there's, there have been planes that have done it. But if, if he had been able to turn down all the engines, it would have been like very, it would have been a very, very dangerous situation. For everybody on board so yeah, um, yeah that's crazy they should they should be able to like you know put that little blue curtain over and just take turns beating his ass all the way back to wherever they're going just whoop his ass for the duration of flight i so, agree update to the story the reason why he tweaked out because turns out he was totally normal in the cockpit everyone thought he was fine and then even after they detained him he like calmed down and he just cooperated apparently he took a bunch of magic mushrooms before the flight i don't believe that shit one bit sounds like propaganda dog uh when interviewed by law enforcement he admitted he'd taken mushrooms before the flight and that he'd been depressed for about six months i'm admitted mm -hmm. to what i did he told the cops according to mm -hmm. an affidavit obtained by the post i'm not fighting any charges you want to bring me against me uh yeah he admitted to taking a bunch of mushrooms Believe he probably it. had no idea what he was doing if he was taking a ton of mushrooms i don't believe uh, it, man. i, don't I know it. billy i i just i think this guy knew what he was going to do, yep. took mushrooms before he got onto the flight because he knew he was probably going to die. So he wanted and to die high. He thought it was going to be like a fantastic experience. But oh. mushrooms ain't like that, man. Have you ever done mushrooms, Billy? Yes. They ain't like low doses. They ain't, so he's even, even worse. I mean, even better. Like So like when you take them very low doses, they change nothing about you, the low yeah. doses. They just they make you feel really good and really enheighten your senses. There are some hallucinogenic aspects of it for sure I depending on how much he did like hero dose but if he was calm afterwards it leads me to believe it wasn't a hero dose i would like to see his you know the blood toxicology of him if he took any it sounds like propaganda they used to do this shit all the time with like weed and all that shit like to make it seem how bad it is because like you know it's, it's it's in discussions right now to make it a i think it's still schedule one if, it, if i'm not mistaken mm -hmm. but they to, to take it off of schedule one and also legalize it in certain places so it sounds, it sounds like propaganda man Oh, they're, they're speculating that he uh, was trying to imitate a FedEx employee, Auburn Calloway, who tried to hijack and crash a cargo plane who was sitting in a jump seat. Uh, and he was trying to part of a premeditated scheme to kill himself so his family could cash in on a multi-million dollar life insurance policy. So yeah. they're looking at his life insurance right now because he may have had to make it look like an accident. So I don't, I don't know if that's actually what he was trying to do that seems like a pretty far leap to go to just because some guy did it on a fedex plane a long time ago like the guy just wanted to get in the cockpit and crash the plane that's what i think happened but that fedex story i'm familiar with that fedex attempted hijacking story it is fucking wild so there was a dude 
same situation. It was a cargo plane. He sat in the jump seat and then he started attacking the pilots in the middle of the flight. I think he had a hammer and he was just beating the fuck out of them with his hammer during the flight. The pilots got up and kicked the shit out of this guy as the planes in the air. They like, it was like a, an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie where they just jumped his ass, beat the fuck out of him until they tied him up with like some cargo netting or some shit. And they barely survived. And, uh, it's a, it's a, I think they survived, right? I don't think the plane um, crashed, but it's a crazy story. No, they restrained him. Yeah. They had, they've got the, the like cockpit voice recorder and you can hear sounds of the struggle. It's a wild story. I don't think that this guy, the only commonality is that they were both pilots sitting in the jump seat on that one. I think he wanted to crash the plane. I think he was, um, obviously depressed. I think he saw like the German wing story. And a couple other times, pilots have just decided to like crash the plane and kill themselves without thinking, well, it's also everybody else on board, or at least they don't care that they're killing everybody else on board. Um, I think this guy wanted to do that. He took mushrooms to either um, get over his sense of consciousness while he was doing that to like make him be able to do it, or he just wanted to be high when he died, uh, and then it didn't work, and then he calmed down. He was probably came to his senses and thought to himself, wow, I really tried to kill a hundred people. Yep. That's what it sounds like more like, but I agree. Everyone on that plane should be able to beat the fuck out of him until it lands. You can, let me preface it. You can do and say some crazy shit while you're on mushrooms. You have to take a high dose for that shit, but it's just not like usually just like very introverted, like scared. Like if, if you do freak out, it's like scary stuff. And it very rarely do people like act out physically. It's just a rare occurrence. Yeah, it's not like PCP. Yeah, it's not like that. But, Working uh, out on low dose is sick. It's one of the most euphoric things. I'm not advocating the, the uses of drugs. Do it at your own risk. But that I've felt, it's one of the most euphoric things that I've felt is m- micro dosing mushrooms. It just feels, feel a part of the world, man, in a very real sense. Have mm-hmm. you ever worked out on it? Yep. Uh, now nah, all my workouts, I was working out for something. So I had to be sober. Well, like working out like for mental health? No, like I was getting paid to work out. You've never worked out recreationally? Not on mushrooms. <laughs> well, like <laughs> just like, oh, I want to get a workout in before the day to feel good all day. Yes, but not on mushrooms. Well, you should try it. I should not. But no one else should. I should I'll, play, I'll, any... play, I'll play golf on mushrooms. That would be dope. That That'd might be really see. dope. Yeah. Yeah. It might make be. you shoot better. Absolutely. But uh Richard Russell, Sky King, he he did it the best. Sky out of, King. They call him Sky King. He's a meme. Uh this dude just hijacked an Air Alaska King, plane Sky too. Sky King. Like, like a self they call him Sky royalty. King. Oh, okay. But but he just hijacked an empty plane and then he just did all these crazy maneuvers in the air, did it oh, all perfectly. I seen that. Yeah. And then he just crashed it, it, it in the middle of nowhere. Suicide. It's actually, and this might sound bad, like listening to his um like the black box of recording or whatever. Mm-hmm. Listening to that was, I mean, it's sad. Dude died. You know, he had family members that loved him. Absolutely. But like there was a like a peacefulness to his voice, man. Like that was like he was very content. You know what I mean? Like he was just like, mm-hmm. "Hey, I just want to you know, I'm sorry." You know, I'm sorry. It was just, I was very, I, you know, I felt funny watching because I was like, I kind of understood him in a sense. Where he was like, "I'm done here." Like I don't know. That's just how that's how I felt. It's it's, it's sad, very sad. If we're th- if we're talking about the same thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, exact same thing. He did. He was doing barrel rolls. Like yeah. that was probably the freest anybody's you, ever. Did felt. you hear him? He sounded so happy. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Like, he was like, and it's like I'm done here. Like. I'm very sorry. Like he knew the people he was gonna hurt. He knew like the plane. He's like, I'm sorry for taking it. But he was like, there was like this moment where I was like, kind of emotional. Like, please don't kill yourself. It's not what I'm advocating here for. But it was a very human moment where I was like, dog, I can relate to his emotions of like, yeah, you know what? I'm I'm done here. Yeah. They gave him a, a landing strip that he could go to. They're like, okay, we've got this airport cleared. You're authorized to land. We just want you back safe. And he's like. Yeah, no, I I never really planned on landing this thing. So uh, thank you, and I'm sorry. Sorry for taking the plane. Yeah. But he was able to pull off some crazy moves in the air, not just the barrel roll. I think he did like a complete 
like inversion loop the loop and then he came down like 50 feet above the ground and pulled up from it it was nuts the shit that he was able to do yeah. as a, a plane expert pft wasn't some Thank of the you. stuff he was doing like impossible and like only like 0.01 percent of people can pull that off i don't know how you would calculate that but he was doing some pretty crazy <laughs> stuff yeah he was he was able to pull off some some wild maneuvers to the point where if this was like a middle eastern terrorist that had hijacked a plane and was able to do damage to people on the ground there would be all kinds of conspiracy theorists out there saying this guy was a trained uh united states military pilot because he was able to do this no pilots are able to execute turns like this Turns out you can. It's it's hard to do, but he was able to pull it off. The Sky King, though, yeah. And it, the one of the wildest parts about it was, if you were in Seattle at the time, you saw this plane flying around, doing crazy acrobatic maneuvers, and everybody was calling nine one one like, "Hey, there's something weird going on with this plane." The entire city saw him pulling this shit off. So, R. I. P. Sky King. R. I. P. Uh, all right. Anything else we want to get into? Are you anybody teed off? Big T, are you teed off about anything right now? I don't think so. A strong Tennessee minute today, though, from Big T with this conspiracy theory. I like that a lot. And I, think I don't even think it's a conspiracy. I think it's it's facts yet to be proven. And this is why I love college football. <laughs> kind of because because it's um, it's conspiracies are that though. Yeah. Could you, be. you have these diehard <laughs> loyalists to their teams. Facts, facts, facts unearthed, yet to, to be yet to be found. I love that. Big T's like, this is a great story. How can I make it about Tennessee football though? How can <laughs> no? I, I mean, well, what, for, what breadcrumbs can I follow to actually put Tennessee in the well, national championship game last year? Well, first of all, Tennessee broke the story, as we said. True. So it, it's already about Tennessee. Are you a member of that message board? Uh, no, I was for one year, which recently expired because they had a, a trial for a dollar and I never used it. You need to get in touch with this person. But I know people who are like on VolQuest eight hours a day. You need to get in touch with this person that uncovered it. Give them your theory and put that guy to work. Well, this, I mean, that's all over. This is not a theory unique to me. I mean, people have been on this all okay. day now. All right. I like it. It's Ho all over Vault. Hopefully we find something about this. Um, Aaron, you ate off about anything? <laughs> not ate off but um i found myself really intrigued watching this um this bachelor episodes these it's it's the golden bachelor it's, it's the one with the old dude have you seen that shit man uh, <laughs> i've seen it bonk you, you're watching it. yeah i've been watching most of it yeah so i'm like hella into it man like I, it was it's it started way... out as a it's way better than the regular Bachelor because the women are actually like so genuine and like the guy is actually so genuine too. Like it's like actually good stuff. Yeah. So it's like I had never watched another Bachelor. You know, I watched some reality TV, but, I, you know, I started watching The Bachelor Golden because like I had a shorty over and she was like, yeah, let's watch. I was mm -hmm. like, let's watch this. And she's like, I right, bet. And so we put it on and I binged like the first three, four, three episodes. And then so like it comes out. Now you're caught up. Yeah, now I'm all caught up. Now I got to wait every week, which is, I mean, I'm kind of, <laughs> I'm on the fence about that because I'm also watch, I watch Love is Blind and, you know, Love Island, stuff like that. They they drop like eight episodes in a well, row. Love, you know? Yeah, Love Island has an episode like every, every day. Every day. That's what I'm saying. So it's like, I got really used to like watching reality TV like that. And, you know, I know Bachelors like ABC or whatever it is. Yeah. So I got to wait a whole week, which <laughs> makes me feel like I'm very inundated with this generation of like, give it to me now. Yeah. And so, but I mean, I'm definitely going to pull up every Thursday to watch that shit, but mm -hmm. it's a really good show, man. He Old is, folks yeah. looking for love. And it's really sad too. Cause it's like all of them on there. Like they weren't out here just wilding their whole lives and like, I'm going to settle down. Like they are all widowed. You know what I mean? Like most of them are widowed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's kind of endearing. I mean, you know, of course a little bit of drama got to, you know what I'm saying? I need that. And, I feel uh, like you'd be the perfect golden bachelor. That's like your perfect age. That'd be yeah. a dope, like uh, cougar, yeah. cougar, <laughs> cougar <laughs> bachelor. Petition Find to get Arian as the a group of 40, bachelor. 50 year olds. Let's get a pop it. I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. It's like your dream. That's my dream. Let's get, let's get that I, shit. If I was a producer for ABC, I I would definitely get you on that yeah. show. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Either that or Naked and Afraid. I'm so down to do a Naked and Afraid dog. <laughs> I hate that show. I, I I need to be on. That's like matter of fact. I think it's a life goal of mine. I want to be on naked and afraid, bro. 
I feel like we could make that. Happen. Someone could make that happen. Right. Man, somebody. I'm in. Like, who Who got to holla at? Producers of Naked and Free. Holla at your boy. I'm in. Don't you hate, like, the outdoors hate, hate in that all. way? Hate it all. But I'm so, I love the show so much that I'm down to do it. <laughs> the only thing I can't do, I will not do, is, like, the swampy shit where you got to go in the water. I'm not doing that shit. Like, I, I'm tapping out. Day one. Imagine, gotta, they, what if they make you go in the ocean? They don't what? It's I mean, a land, they don't drop you in the water. I know, but like, what if you like have to like try to find fish in the ocean? The only way if I'm out there to survive, it's whatever. It's me versus the elements. You know what I mean? But like the swamp shit, I'm not. Fuck that. <laughs> Would you? I think you have to get rid. What? I've been fascinated with rabies oh, recently. You gotta finish that word a little faster. <laughs> yeah. That shit was wild. Wait, what I say? <laughs> Rab- oh, ra- oh, rabies. Rabies. No, rabies. No, rabies. I recently Jesus got a rabies. Fuck vaccination and it's when they inject dead rabies virus into you and uh been feeling <laughs> some uh what yeah I, I that what the some... vaccination is yeah yeah different than some of the newer ones uh but been getting great gains from it uh chad um thad castle had some points about injecting rabies just had to say that but like if you get bit by something in the wild you're gonna have to get rabies shots I'm down. I don't. I don't. I don't care about vaccinations, bro. Give it. Give no. It to what me if all. like I will drink them shits. All of them. I actually got five recently. Yeah, you're the worst Aaron vegetarian just, of all time. Just, just wanted to show you. I got five vaccinations. I'm proud of you, though. I'm a fan. Thank you. Science, science, bitch. Rabies, a hundred percent preventable, but a hundred percent mortality rate. Hundred percent. There's one dude that died or that did not die from rabies, though. Really? Just one? I think there's yeah, just dude. one. That's fucking wild, though. <laughs> if you get rabies and don't get the vaccine, you are fucked. Yeah. Like, it's like, bad are we death, talking bro. death or just like there's like super like it's going to fuck you up? No, bro. It's Once death, you get death. afraid of water, you, there's no there's no help. Once you to get be fair, everything's 100 percent fatal. It's true. Life is. Yeah. Oxygen, hundred no, percent fatal. Mm-hmm. Once you get to that, I'm not scared true. of water. Not true. You're done. Actually, oxygen, oxygen is fatal. Kill you. Everyone who's breathed, it's died. That's a causation versus correlation fallacy. Everything's fatal. Okay. <laughs> Dihydrogen <laughs> oxide. Listen to this podcast. Eventually, it'll kill you. Mm-hmm. Well, that's... the world's most deadly that's... podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's I good, like that shit. That's good for Halloween too. Not, not for Jimmy Carter though. Listen to this podcast if you want that to That actually, yeah. I mean, we do have a tendency to have. Yeah. Mm, Carter broke that streak, though. That's that's a good, that's a feather in our cap. Yep. But, well, I mean, there's always exceptions to every rule. So if you don't want to die and you listen to this podcast, siphon Jimmy Carter's blood and good luck to you. Mm-hmm. He's found some secret. <laughs> All right. I wonder what. We're going to get to uh, a great interview that we have coming up in a second here. We're going to talk about interrogations, police interrogations, before we get to it. And then he's going to come over the top and uh, give us some behind-the-scenes stuff. His name's Stan B. Walters. He's the, the lie guy. And uh, the rest of the episode is going to be brought to you by our great friends over at BetterHelp. Macrodosing is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you ever feel like your brain is getting in its own way? Like you know what you should do, what's good for you, but you just can't do it? Therapy helps you figure out what's holding you back so you can work for yourself instead of against yourself. I've personally benefited from therapy. I've talked to grief counselors. I've uh, gone through therapy in the past. It definitely helps you prioritize your thoughts. It helps you settle down with yourself, figure out what the best course of action for it is. You feel better in general. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and you get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Make your brain your friend with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash dose today. Get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash dose. Get 10% off your first month with BetterHelp. All right. Interrogations, police interrogations. If I could borrow a phrase from uh, the lawyers on Twitter and on YouTube that are have gone famous for this, when a police officer asks you to sit down in an interrogation room, 
shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up Fridays, right? That's that, Have you seen those guys? There's two lawyers with the glasses and the cigars that they're always smoking, usually in a parking lot somewhere. Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up Fridays. If you're talking to a police officer, like don't, like, listen, I, I actually don't have anything against police officers at all. I think the vast majority of them are, are great people, and a lot of them are extremely brave, and they want to help. They want to protect if they can, but they're just human beings like anybody else. And in their line of work, there's a lot of pressure on them, and you've got some bad apples that, uh, with that much power in their hands, should be held accountable for everything that they do. Um, but in general, I don't think that when police are interrogating you, I think they're trying to solve a problem, and I think that there's a lot of pressure on them to get the uh, get a conviction or at least to make an arrest, and they get tunnel vision. And so if for whatever reason a police officer thinks that you've done something bad, it's going to be very hard to convince them otherwise, if not impossible to convince them otherwise. And their entire purpose in that room is to make you incriminate yourself in some way. And they will twist words. They will lie to you to try to get that confession. Um, because they want to check off, okay, that's that's one less crime that I have to solve. It's good for their closure rate. And uh, they will absolutely ruin your life, even if you're innocent sometimes. So there's been a shocking number of people that have confessed who are innocent of crimes. And slowly, some of them are getting let out of prison thanks to DNA evidence and things like that. But if you're if a cop talks to you and they want to know your name, they want to know what you're doing if you're in a specific location like be i would say be polite and answer their questions and if they start digging into anything that you've done before then you say i would prefer not to answer these questions because one thing that i've learned doing research here and uh if you want to check out a, a really interesting book i would highly recommend it's called you have the right to remain innocent and yeah really really smart guy he kind of has the same mindset where like he's not anti-police officer. He's not anti um, the court system, but he does think that the judicial system is uh, it's set up to fuck people over if you don't know what you're doing. And he's he's 100 percent right about that, that it's a rigged game. And uh, if you don't have a legal background, then you're playing with a light hand and you will get ran over and steamrolled, even if you're innocent. Sometimes honesty so, gets you nowhere in our justice system. Yeah. Yeah, and because if you misspeak about something during an interrogation or, okay, let's put it this way, Big T, what were you doing last Tuesday at 6.15 p.m.? Probably playing PlayStation, but uh, which I could <laughs> tell you for sure. Would you bet your life on that? 6.15? Uh, no. Yeah, so if, if a police officer asks you that and you say, I was playing PlayStation... And you happen to be wrong about that. Maybe you were thinking about Wednesday you were playing PlayStation. Maybe you were playing PlayStation at 7.15. Yeah, no, it's a safe bet every night I'm playing PlayStation. <laughs> it's a matter of what time. Yeah, it just, it, it seems like, uh, well, it doesn't seem like, it's just a fact that if you misremember something that trivial, then they'll be like, he's lying to us about something. We like him for this crime. Then they'll try to get you to incriminate yourself. You'll They'll put you in a room for eight hours. They won't give you food or water. And they'll just beat you down until you say something to get yourself out of that room, which in all likelihood could be confessing to something that's part of this crime. Um, but what this guy wrote in his book, which is fascinating, is that if you talk to any um, child of a prosecutor or of a police officer and you ask them, what have your parents taught you about talking to the police? They will all say, my dad or mom taught me do not do an interrogation without a lawyer present. Don't say anything. So even police officers are telling their kids this, knowing that the techniques they use behind the scene are designed to coerce a confession out of you. They're telling their own kids this, but a lot of people don't have the benefit of having parents that are involved in the legal system that can then tell them, hey, this is the deal. Don't talk to police. So it's not, it's not like anti-police to say that when the police are telling their own children that and they're right because they will, you will get, you will get fucked up if you try to uh, like spin your way out of something. Or if you, um, there's a classic example actually of these two guys up in Toronto and uh, it was one of the guy's birthday. What was the guy's name? I think it was like, he had a cool nickname that he went by. 
I want to say Magic or something like that. But it was Magic's birthday. Let's call him Magic. It was his birthday party, and they rented out a banquet hall. And his good friend was there with him the entire time. A bunch of people come in, have a fun time. At about 4 o'clock, one of the guests gets shot out front in the parking lot, gets murdered. Um, cops come in, interrogate everybody. They interrogate Magic, ask him where he was. They interrogate his best friend. And they both give the same story to the police, which is we were inside wrapping up pieces of birthday cake to hand out to people that were leaving when somebody came in and said there's a shooting in the parking lot. That's when we found out what happened. Um, and so the cops keep looking about a year goes by. They keep reinterrogating people that were at this party until one person that was there uh, sees a video. And in the video, there's somebody wishing magic a, a happy birthday. And the woman was like, wait, I had heard that it was the person that uh, the person that shot the guy. It was his birthday party. So if it's his birthday, that means that he's the murderer. Told the police that. And then the police reinterrogate Magic and his friend who they were witnesses for each other. And Magic's friend says, no, 100 percent. I was there with him. Why are you accusing me of covering up for him? The cops then threaten Magic's best friend and they say, Right now, what you're doing, you are an accessory to murder because you're lying to a police officer in a homicide investigation. So you have two choices. This is after like nine or 10 hours. Uh, you have two choices. One, we can arrest you for accessory to murder and you're looking at 10 to 20 years in prison and you won't go home. You won't see your family. You're going to be in prison right now. Or two, you can tell us that you're, you've been lying this entire time and that you weren't standing by magic when you found out that there had been a shooting outside. And after standing up to the detectives for all day, the guy was like, oh, well, shit, I don't want to go to prison for 15 years. So I'm going to tell them what I, what they want to hear. Told them that he was not with his friend. Then they arrest the guy for murder. Uh, it goes to trial. And right before, or I guess as the trial gets started, the female witness says that she's not 100% sure that it's him as the shooter. She just heard that it was the birthday boy who was the shooter. So then she implied that that was magic that did the shooting. This guy spent, I think, like four or five years in prison for a murder that he had absolutely nothing to do with because they leaned on his best friend and threatened his best friend with prison time. And then his best friend eventually caved and gave in to him. So they will do all sorts of shit to make you confess to something. Mm -hmm. uh, either that they think you did or they think you know. So... Um, shut the fuck up. So shut the fuck up. You were talking Central about Central Park Five. Yeah, you were talking Another about crazy story DNA earlier, and people always talk about. Imagine how easy it was to get away with a crime before DNA. Imagine how horrifying it was to be accused of a crime that you didn't do before there was DNA. Right, and there might be a little bit of circumstantial evidence that, like, you can't refute or whatever that puts you. Maybe you know something could have happened. Like, what do you do there? Because I, I, when I was looking up stuff, I mean, there's all sorts of people, dozens and hundreds who got out of prison after 15, 20, 30 years once DNA became a thing. Yeah. And by the way, DNA, like, it's only been around for 30 years. Yeah. Which is pretty <laughs> insane. Like, we think of DNA as this, like, well, that's how you solve a crime. That only existed since the 90s. Yeah, the OJ trial was one of the first big examples of it and they had to explain to everybody like what dna was and how it could be used in determining who committed a crime um there was uh well, yeah i was say, i'll say a big factor in this too is like jury right you it's your constitutional right to have a trial of a jury of your peers and this i found out recently right because i just went through a court case of my own the jury selection um i guess like the way that they do it is is so fucking it's just it's not a jury of your peers right it's a jury of selected who they it is random but like you get to you get to x out jurors that you don't feel like will be favorable to, to you they get to mm -hmm. x out jurors who, who who don't think they'll be favorable to them so there's di there's a different ways you can shuffle like there's different ways to like kind of manipulate who you get in a jury box and ultimately it's the jurors that don't have a lot of knowledge in the specific case that your case may be about. And so what you then do, it's a show. Then it's one lawyer versus another, and it's a show on which who can 
evoke emotion out of jurors um, that don't really necessarily that might not have the odds are they won't have expertise in that specific field of whatever they're um, uh, ruling on. And it's just a, it's just a crapshoot. So it's like it's, it just becomes this show. And it's one of the most infuriating things that you could possibly be a part of, especially I couldn't imagine like I had something small on the line, but it's still, you know, it meant a lot to me. But like if my life was on the line, having a juror set that have no idea what the fuck they're listening to and no idea and they do the best that they can, but they just don't know. So they're getting presented this facade. You know what I mean? And that's all it is. It's a show. Jur like juror trials are just a fucking show. And it's it's one of the most, I guess, like we think it's one of the most, I guess, marketed things like the the just the system, the jury system, innocent until put it is it is so far from actually being an accurate representation of 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 justice that it's laughable. It's it is it is a shit show, literally. Mm-hmm. I saw that uh, Trump's lawyer fucked up. I think it was in the New York trial. His lawyer fucked up and forgot to request a jury trial. So now it's just going to oh, be a the, bench trial. It's going to be a bench trial where it's just the judge <laughs> that is going to find him guilty or not guilty based on the evidence. That's uh, fucked up. <laughs> and if it had been, if it's a jury trial, I would say that probability of a hung jury in any Trump trial is going yeah, to be very high. Way high. Because higher. what, 47%? of voters voted for Trump. Mm -hmm. So are you going to get 12 people that uh, all hate Donald Trump on a jury together? Probably not. You're going to get a hung jury and his lawyer just forgot to check a box. And so he has That's to do a bench That's wild trial. actually. Yeah. Honestly, but in New York, there's no way to... it's probably like 90% of people in New York who show up for jury duty are probably. It don't matter. Like them. you need, you need, I think it's I think it's like ten out of twelve or something like that, and if it, it just and if you just have three hung jury, two staunch Republicans on the jury. Yeah, that's, that's really but I, honestly, mm -hmm. it, so in my opinion, this is just my opinion, right? I think that this should be a career path. I think you should have jury selection, like like a, 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 and the that's what they do. They 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 go through this process. This is what they do for a living. Because let's say you're on a murder trial and you've ne you don't have no idea what forensic evidence is you have no idea what and like you know what I'm saying and somebody's life is on the line now you're just this like this is a chef who cooks meals every day and has no idea about you know blood stains and samples and all this stuff i would rather have somebody who has an expertise in this field that sees this shit on a daily basis that way can make an accurate depiction it's less of a show because jury trials it's all like you're you're just trying to evoke emotions out of the jury right that's why they bring in these big ass poster boards and like it's just, you're just trying to draw off emotions rather than the facts of the case um and it just lead to me it just leads to a lot of amb ambiguous um facts ambiguous language that goes on that just it's just to me it it, it doesn't lead to a fair and just trial in my opinion Law students might make a good, just make every juror like a bunch of law students. I, I don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't know the remedy, but I think it, I, th I think it should be something that like you, you, you work every day, you go to tr trials, you're just a juror, like that, that would be because you see it, and then you start to see, and it, to me, it makes, it makes, it makes lawyers more accountable for that job because right now lawyers, especially that do jury trials. Lawyers act differently in bench trials than they do in jury trials because they know the judge sees this shit all day. So those tricks don't work. All that bullshit doesn't work. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they just have to present the facts of the case and, and, and persuade a judge, which sees this every day, who's knowledgeable about the law. You can't you can't you can't dissuade a judge that knows what the fuck they're talking about. Right. So you have to really lawyer. You really have to advocate on the facts and the merit of the case. When you have a jury trial, you're dealing with laymen who don't see this on a daily basis and you just trying to evoke emotion. That's all you're trying to do is like pull on their, their pull, you're pulling on their ignorance and you're pulling on their emotion. I, I think you're right about that. I'm just thinking what it would look like if there were, if you had lawyers that were also on the jury, because it might be like, you know how when musicians listen to a band and if you're like an accomplished musician, a lot of times you've got like a snobby sense of like what's good music and what's not. Yeah. Like so, when you call it a chords pretentious, I remember. There are such things as pretentious chords, See, but there you go. You proved your own point. I, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. There you go. So if you get like a <laughs> jazz pianist and you play the new Blink One Eight Two album, he'll be like, "This shit sucks." Uh, but if you have a bunch of 
jurors that are lawyers, they would probably be more inclined to like give the benefit of the doubt to whoever the better lawyer was. You know what I'm saying? Like they, yeah, yeah that's oh, this right. guy made a lot of mistakes. I don't, you know, he's a little rough around the edges. He uh, lost like they do like advanced stats and analytics. This guy had a, a minus three war on his uh, objection percentage. Got a lot of shit overruled. Um, and they, then they would be like, well, the shitty lawyer is bad. So I'm going to give it to the good lawyer. I'm a ho ho I mean, that that's why I don't think law uh, lawyers would be. Oh, someone's at my front door. I don't think a lawyer would be a good juror for, for, for that exact reason that you're talking about. But what I do, I, I think that there should be like a litany of things that you have to adhere to, right? In order mm -hmm. to accomplish this job and then just train people for that, right? It could be like a six month, one year program that pays a good salary that that then you know what to look for. Family law versus criminal law versus all this, you know what I'm saying? Like just educate the jurors on, on the on the different nuances of every case that way. And then you can have somebody who's been in it 10, 10 years. I've been a juror for 10 years that's seen every family law, everything, the lawyers aren't going to like, you can't, you can't play the game anymore. You have mm -hmm. to actually lawyer, you know what I'm saying? But I do have a question for you. That's kind of off topic, but kind of on when you were saying there's pretentious courts, did you see that, that clip that went viral about that Juilliard pianist that, uh, that, uh, changed, uh, that, that, that changed Beethoven's, um, no, 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 for at least. I did not. No, no, no. So it, it, it was like super viral, right? I'll send it to you real quick. But so he changed, so he 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 was he was talking to uh I forget his name, he's a famous journalist, but he changed the um the genre of Beethoven into two different ones on the fly. And I wanna see I wanna I want I want you to hear this and you tell me if it's if it's um if it's pretentious. When I say pretentious chords, I'm talking about making something needlessly complicated. This is what I'm I know exactly what you're talking about, brother. Here okay. I'm gonna do it. Hold on. That's, that's pretentious. You, you no, that's no, pretentious. no. That's, I mean, that's really cool. Like, that's what I'm saying. How no, can that's you that's awesome. I, I'm I'm talking about people that that write songs and then they're like, oh, that chord is not interesting enough for me, so I'm just going to change it and make it sound weird to satisfy my internal thirst as a musician to make it cool to me and my musician friends that are going to listen to it. That is that's just talent. That's really good. I like that a lot. Yeah, he's fire. By the way, check him out if you can. I will. No, he's yeah. insane. Dope shit. All right, sorry. All right. Proceed. Just had to ask that. Yeah, Billy, what were you going to say? Did you guys know that Miranda, as in Miranda Rights, is a dude? Oh, you thought it was a woman's first name? You thought it well, was... Well, I mean, there was probably a lot. Yeah, I was thought it was like I'm going to keep it Miranda. a band, Billy. I did not know that. I, th I thought it was named after yeah, some kind see, of woman see, all well. these... Yeah, it, a lot of people probably think, like, if they think Miranda Rights, they just think, oh, like, Miranda? Someone called Miranda? You thought it was, like, Girl Sex Rights. in the City? Yeah, yeah. Girl Rights. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Miranda, you need to keep your mouth closed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, it might be like the origin of the name Miranda's from some Greek mythology where, like, she wouldn't stop talking or something. But, anyways, this dude, God Ernesto. Damn, Billy, 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 <laughs> Billy, just, Billy just made the most sexist no. myth of all time. How, no what? Fucking way you yeah. just said that. <laughs> what? It's like a Greek play. Like, Fellas, like am I right? Arachnus. <laughs> like Arachnus was so about Zeus, someone who couldn't stop sewing, right? Zeus, I love Zeus how had this had this <laughs> hot, hot side piece, but she was just talking. She, was, she wouldn't let him watch the, the game. Oh. She always wanted him to come over and talk about how his day was. <laughs> She just wouldn't Dude. shut the fuck up. All right. No, no. I think this isn't on me. This is an indictment how on how he, Greek I love how mythology is sexist he set it up as fuck. To be, he set it up to be not misogynistic and then just totally 180'd himself, dog, into being the most <laughs> worst shit you could Wait, say. Wait, Billy, how is it on Greek mythology? This, this because Greek exist. mythology you is sexist this. as fuck. Did it you is. just think it was Greek mythology? I don't know. I was just like in my head, like a random origin of Miranda rights. Like it might be something like that. Like, uh, uh, there's some other law that's named after myths that applies. Romeo and Juliet law. 
What's that one? It's not that Ernest, one's about it's dating when you're on. I don't know. It's from Transformers. <laughs> so Ernesto or Arturo Miranda admitting guilt. Mm-hmm. What? You're talking about age of consent laws? There's some like Roma. I, don't, I was thinking of like a myth or like some sort of old story that was like part of a law. Okay. Now I'm just digging myself a digger hole. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Ernesto Arturo Miranda admitted he was guilty. And then he got off because even though he confessed, he wasn't told he could have an attorney present. Mm -hmm. Uh, And basically they struck it down. And even though he committed a bunch more crimes, uh, that's why everyone's told their Miranda rights before. Yeah. Which are you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. It's almost become like you just hear that and it becomes white noise in the background because it's on like every cop TV show. But what they're telling you is anything you tell us right now, we will use to convict you of a crime. That's what they're saying. So so the equation is this. Either you can walk out of here and keep your mouth shut, or you can try to explain to us why you're innocent, and then we'll take all the shit that you say and use it to make you guilty. Which would you rather do? Like they, If they're asking you questions, it's because they don't have the answer to it. So shut the fuck up. And also, you have the right to an attorney. In Canada, it's a little bit different. They got weird interrogation laws in Canada where you have the right to an attorney so you can call a lawyer, but then your lawyer will sit with you privately in a room for a while, give you advice, and then you have to go back in and be interviewed by the cop, one-on-one with the cop. And you have to remember everything that your lawyer told you. I kind of like that. That puts it on the coaching. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you've got to be you've got to be coachable. You've got to have a good coach. Mm-hmm. Attention to detail. Have y'all um, seen have y'all seen Mr. Turner DUI stuff? No. Please, y'all haven't seen this? Oh my god. It's like five minutes, bro, but it is probably the most funny. It's sad because you can tell my man's just struggling, but it's the funniest shit. It went viral years ago, bro. Like it, it <laughs> she starts reading him his Miranda rights at the end. Cause like he's drunk and he has to do a field sobriety test. And he's like just talking shit. It's the place that he's like, yeah, I was drunk, but I wasn't motherfucking driving. It, the, the whole <laughs> the whole shit is just him going off on the officer like that. He said, you close your motherfucking eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so Who's Mr. Turner? That's him. It, it, I don't know. Oh, he's a random name, but that's dude. What they call him Mr. Turner on joke. But if you get a chance to check this out, <laughs> it's, it's by far the funniest. Is it true that if you get pulled over? And you're drunk and you jump out of the car and chug a handle of open a handle of vodka and chug it and then say, I was drunk after I stopped driving that you can get out of a DUI. I doubt that, man. That's true, Billy. (laughs) That's like an urban legend. I know it sounds ridiculous. I actually think it could muddy the waters enough where it wouldn't be like the worst idea if you were already drunk. It probably won't work, but that's a pretty bad idea, man, because if you jump out of a car while it's moving, it's going to lead us to believe that you probably, something's wrong in the first place. <laughs> no, just, no, I'm not saying fucking, stop the car. You just, you just jump out barrel no. roll with a bottle of what? vodka that you're holding like a football. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> Get up and what? just swig that shit and say, sir, I just got drunk. <laughs> How could you possibly take what I just said that literally? Like pull over after you get pulled over for a DUI, then pop out of the car and chug the, like park the car. And you, then just you, like start chugging you, you, alcohol. You, you're probably white if you're thinking this. If you go and pull over after a cop pulls you over and get out of the car with <laughs> anything in your hand. I, yeah. Yeah, that's actually very true. Hell no. You crazy. That. You might be a redneck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually don't think it's the worst advice ever. That's bad because, advice. No, it's well, terrible advice. If, Some if, people, I mean, if you it's are fucked drunk, up advice. Because think about it. They would have to prove somehow what your BAC was before you started drinking that vodka. Well, not really, not you. if they have you like swerving all over the road and stuff. Right, there's extenuating circumstances, but they would have less evidence. It's yeah. it probably wouldn't work, but it's also It'd there's be funny something as hell to, to watch. That's there's sure. something to it. If you it wouldn't activate that quickly though, was, right? That's what I was just going to say. Like if if I right now no, it's in your started mouth, chugging alcohol and then immediately did a breathalyzer, would it would my BAC be high? I don't think, I think so. so. I no, no it, it takes it 30 minutes, I thought. No. no, but it would be in your mouth, and that's why if you do uh, Listerine right before a blowing into Bl- a BAC thing, yeah, you're, it'll be like crazy amounts. 
And that's another, like, so then you can get to the police station. They have to take your blood and your BAC goes under. And so it, it makes it, it makes it a lot more complicated to the cop that's arresting, arresting you and also like processing you because they'll do a blood sample and then they'll do another blood sample as the, uh, to determine like how much alcohol you drank after the DUI stop. But then they have to do all sorts of math to think how much you drank when you were stepping out of the car, how long that should take to impact your system. And then what's the difference between that and what you were at, uh, pre getting pulled over. And that's a lot of math, especially if you like spill some of the bottle on the ground, they have no idea how much you drank out of the bottle. Um, it would, it would muddy the waters enough to the point where it might, it might work. It probably wouldn't. If you smash the bottle on the floor with an unknown amount of alcohol in it. Yeah, it probably wouldn't work. And it would probably make you appear more guilty, uh, the fact that you did that. And if they've got you like swerving and shit, Aaron, I think you're muted right now. I'm mad, I'm mad you're saying probably. I'm, done, I'm mad you're entertaining this at all. <laughs> but wasn't there a, a politician that uh, crashed the car left the scene and then was found in a bar drinking and you and they're like did you just crash your car he was like yeah it was so intense i i ran to this bar and started drinking and they couldn't like and he did that because he he didn't want to get caught with a high bac and then he was like yeah no i was i took a bunch of shots once i was in here so if my bac let me i think it was like it was a lot to do with it was a stressful situation i was trying to decompress no i have to get a new car <laughs> as far as billy's bro science ideas go this is it's not the worst one that I've ever heard. It probably, Bro science applies to law a lot. It probably wouldn't work, but um, but it might. Who knows? Uh, Big T, you were talking about, about DNA evidence and how if DNA evidence existed a long time ago, then there's probably a bunch of people that would never have been arrested in the first place or convicted in the first place, which is probably true. But there's also a lot of shit where um, the police have DNA evidence that points away from the person who's already in jail and they refuse to admit that to be a reason to let them out. So an example would be um, Chicago. I don't know if it's still true about Chicago, but I know 10 years ago it was Chicago was called the false confession capital of the United States because they had a rate of false confessions that were twice as high as any other city in America. And um, there were a couple of circumstances where I think they accused uh, three or four kids who were all aged like 14 to 17 of rape and murder of a uh, 14 year old girl. That was their classmate. Horrible crime. And uh, they, I guess somebody in their school told the police, I think these guys did it. No evidence, really. They take the kids, they isolate them. No parents, no lawyers, nothing like that. And they interrogate them for like six hours each. And initially all the kids are like, no, we didn't have anything to do with it. We weren't there. We weren't doing anything. And after about six or seven hours, um, they start telling the kids one by one, listen, you're a kid. This is not that serious of a matter. It's going to go to juvenile matters and then you'll be on probation. So if you want to go home, if you want to see your parents right now, just tell us that you did it and you can go home. And then we'll work our way through the courts and you'll probably under be under like judicial watch for a couple of years. And then once you turn 18, it's expunged. You'll be fine. Um, after six hours, the kids are like, OK, I'll I'll sign this confession that you wrote for me um, if it means I can go home to my family. And this is all over with. They sign it. They all get arrested. They all get charged with, I think, first degree murder and rape. And they get sentenced to like. 40 years in prison. So they're in prison. They didn't do this thing. Right. And, uh, the innocence project, which goes around trying to collect DNA evidence that could exonerate people that have already been convicted. Um, they get a DNA test of this, this girl that had been killed and they find out that there's DNA that, uh, matches up with somebody that's got like 39 charges, uh, serial rapist, like this all adds up. It's it's a person that lived in the area and this is their pattern of behavior and the DNA is right there. The prosecutor says, well, no, what probably happened was that guy found the dead body and had sex with the dead body. That's crazy. And, I, and I'm going to keep all these kids in jail. And eventually there was enough public outcry by it. The lawyers took it to court and they got the convic convictions overturned. And they all went home. 
uh, and they didn't have anything to do with it whatsoever. They just took away, I think, like 20 years of their life um, because of this DNA thing. And there was also another group of uh, kids in Chicago that had like a very similar story where they find DNA evidence that lets them off. And they're like, well, the confession is going to trump the DNA evidence because most people would think if they read like a five page confession with details of the crimes, nobody would confess to this brutal crime unless they did it. So that is going to trump the DNA evidence when on the other side of things, if they don't have, if, if they did have DNA evidence on you and you said you didn't do the crime, then they just use the DNA evidence to convict you of that crime. So it's not really like a two way street that way sometimes. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times it is, but there's, there's been a lot of cases where they won't let you out just because you have DNA evidence that would prove that somebody else did the crime besides you. That's what happened with the Central Park Five was they was really they was sitting there and they 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 were scared their little kids and the, and they were like very aggressive and they were just like we know you did it we know you did it and over hours they were just like look if you want to go home you got to tell the truth when it comes you want to go home if you want to go home and that and then their heads are like well shit I'm gonna go home just tell them what they want to hear mm -hmm. and after a while so like at, when they're giving their confessions it's literally like okay so tell me what happened like he said I was walking. And, and I saw the lady and I hit her with the, and they were like, no, 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 you didn't hit her with that. You hit her with this. And he was like, yeah, 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 yeah. I hit her with this. And it was like, literally they were just coaching him what to say. And like, it, it was super sad. And actually one of the, one of the Central Park Five um, that got exonerated, um, I think he's running for some kind of office. I think he, he might be in now. I don't know. He's running for some kind of office in New York. Um, so shout out to that. But I mean, literally like, this is why I'm so vehemently against the death penalty because if you if you have one false conviction, you took you took somebody's life away, just one, and it's to mm -hmm. me one life isn't worth that shit. And so, and plus, it's more expensive to just keep people. Plus, I think killing somebody that has done something horrendous. It's it's it it almost like exonerates them. They don't have to live through the you know carnage of what they did in their mind or you know the time. You know, it, it, literally to me, a better punishment is just sitting, not having all your rights taken away. Mm -hmm. Have you watched? Dying. Have you watched Making a Murderer? Yeah. That was have you wild. watched Convicting a Murderer? Mm -mm. So is your that, girl is that, is that the Candace Candace Owens? Owens? Yeah. yeah. I, I always it. say it before before you before you spoil it. Don't spoil it for me. Before you do, I always say I thought that motherfucker was shady, even though it doesn't look like they have all the evidence. He was doing some weirdo shit. That's just not that didn't sit. That didn't jive with me very well. So, but go ahead. Go ahead. I yeah. Hear it. I watched the first. I think four episodes of convicting a murder, mm -hmm. the Candace Owens thing. What's it on? Daily Wire subscriber. I'm not a subscriber. I pri I pirated it. You have it. to be a subscriber no, I, to I, watch. I pirated it. I found I found Big illegal T, websites. Big T, give me a, uh, send me your password and you, and you log in. I don't have it yet. I'm I'm looking into it though. I might I might be a subscriber <laughs> soon. Uh, I I will say this. I I agree with a lot of what Candace put in her documentary. I think that there's uh, and also when I watched Making a Mur Murderer the first time. There is a lot of shit that you're like, wait, they kind of glossed over that part of it. Yep. And they did leave a lot of stuff out. Uh, he was a would, creep. He was an absolute creep. Yeah. He he was like murdering cats, throwing them into fires and shit. And they like kind of touched on that, but they didn't actually get into the details of what happened. Yeah. And there was another incident where he pulled over on the side of the road and like threatened his cousin's life with a gun and almost shot him. And he was stalking that person. And um, that's not to say that that, makes him guilty of murdering Teresa Hallbeck. But there's a lot of stuff that they left out about that whole scene where like he was, he was calling her from block numbers, trying to make mm -hmm. sure that she was the one that was going to come out. He was yeah. calling her from like friends phones, trying to make sure that she was the one that, that was going to come out. Um, there's, there's a whole lot of stuff in making a murderer that they put in there that does not really tell the story and interviews of people that were on scene at the time, including the news reporter that everybody fell in love with. You remember her? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, shout out her. She was great. Very competent person at her job. Uh, they interviewed her and she was saying like, yeah, none of this really added up with what we were all thinking at the time. The only thing I, I do agree with, with making a murderer is that um, his, Brendan, was that the name of the Brendan, yeah, Dassey? Brendan Dassey? He got fucked. He got fucked because yeah. he was a, a, a kid with limited cognitive abilities and he didn't have a lawyer with him. And he was in a long interrogation, basically saying, do you want to go home? That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And they fed him the story and then he repeated the story. Uh, who knows 
if what he said was the truth or not, but it does seem like he kind of got fucked over on that uh, because of the pressure of interrogation. I can't but, believe his, because his went to like, I think the Wisconsin Supreme Court or something, or it may, may, may have been a federal court, uh, and it didn't get overturned. And yeah. I was very shocked by that. Yeah, I so, was too. So is Candace Owens saying like uh, that he did it? Yes. Okay, because when I watched Making a Murder, I was like, this is a travesty. This guy's so innocent. I watched it, I was like, it seems like he probably did that shit. I think <laughs> a lot of people had that reaction, right? Now, Brendan, uh, that guy, that kid, I, I feel horrible. I mean, he got absolutely railroaded, and it seems like he probably didn't do anything. But that guy was like, mm, seems like he probably did it. Yeah. Now, there were some convenient circumstances around it that, like, seemed, oh, that's kind of shady, like, you know, with the city owing him all that money and yep. whatever. But it seemed like he probably killed her. Yes. And it like it was very tough what Stephen Avery was going through. He was in jail for a long time for a rape that he did not commit. Um, so you feel sympathetic for him as he's getting out of jail. But yeah, I I think I think Avery did that shit. And uh, they do some interviews with people that are like dedicated uh, Stephen Avery truthers online. People that just like got really into the true crime documentary and like spent their entire lives connecting dots on essentially like college message board posters. Right. If their favorite school was Stephen Avery <laughs> and uh, they interview these people and these people just are in way over their heads trying to explain why was it, he's innocent. Was it in, I don't know if it was in the documentary or if I saw it uh, afterwards, but wasn't there some lady that fell in love with this nigga in jail after, yeah. after all this shit went through and they writing love letters, but that's the most batshit crazy thing that you could possibly do is fall in love with somebody you never wet and and they're in jail like i'm that sorry happens a lot yeah that's crazy as shit though like there's like a thing i think there's a term for that with people who fall in love with people who are like with killers in jail yeah like they, they feel like they fall in love with the lore of them being like murderers they, they say it's a survival technique that like way back in the day like during caveman times, killers, if you were like, if they were killing people around you and you knew they were killers, it was better to be their mate. So they like, so there's like a psychological thing where you're attracted to killers. A protection? But if they're yeah. killing women and you're a woman, I, it's, uh, it, it is a weird psychological thing. Some guys have that too. I know there are a lot of dudes out there, not me personally, but um, like fell in love with Casey Anthony. Yeah, that's she's real kind of hot. She's, I she's think that's bad. just horny, dude. See, this would be, yeah. be horny, but like, I, I, I would. Would you? No, gr girls felt the same way about TJ Lane. Who's that? Who's he that? was the. Uh, While well, she looks it up, Chardon, Chardon, um, killer. Okay. Chardon, Ohio, right by me. But he was the one. I think he was the one that wore like murderer on his shirt in his trial. Um. Oh, he's a high school shooter. Yeah. High school, oh, yeah. Ted Bundy, to not Ted Bundy. Yeah, Ted, yeah, Ted Bundy. Bundy. Ted Bundy. Was, it was a hard yeah. job. Who's yeah. Zach? Zach Efron. Ted Bundy. Yes. Yes. Ted, yeah. Yeah. But TJ mm -hmm. Lane, I remember people were obsessed with him. Like girls were obsessed with him, which I. Uh, that's. I think it. Go, I think it's some weird psychological thing. Yeah. Uh, Stephen uh, Avery and his fiance have parted ways, unfortunately. Damn. Oh, I dead. thought that was gonna work out. What is love anymore? You know. That sucks. Get Stephen Avery on The Golden Bachelor. <laughs> oh man that would be crazy though another crazy uh interrogation story gone wrong is uh so they picked up this guy who was found with his girlfriend dead in the bed and he had a black eye and they took him in for questioning and you know they were questioning him for six hours uh, he was in the squad car. They just wouldn't let him go. He was visibly confused and they kept asking him, Hey, did you kill her? Did you kill her? He's like, dude, I don't know. I think she's asleep and he's really messed up. What they then find out is that he had been shot under the eye and someone else had came in, shot his girlfriend, shot him. But because the bullet like messed up his brain, he had been walking around the house sort of like lobotomized thinking that his girlfriend was asleep and the cops didn't realize to like, 10 hours into interrogation that he actually had a bullet wound in his eye. Yeah. And he's fucked up. I, I don't know if that guy's still alive now, but he was, he was completely fucked up. Four Come bullet out. holes in his face. How, so how you don't notice a bullet hole in somebody's face? Well, so if you I, look at the picture, I, send me that. Cause that's, I'm going to send you the picture crazy. because it, it was it, like it, a it, small caliber weapon, I think. And one of it went through the bridge of his nose. So he had like a hole, a small hole in his nose. He had a black eye that had some blood coming out of it. And that's from where, 
the bullet went into his brain and then it came out, I think the side of his head or it lodged in his brain. I forget, but yeah, they, they thought that this guy killed his girlfriend and that's why he like didn't have an explanation of what happened, but it turns out that it was like his, um, like landlord's brother or something like that. There were two guys that came to his house, invaded the house, shot his girlfriend, shot him. And yeah, they, they probably caused significant brain damage to this kid as they were interrogating him the entire time. Oh, Just, yeah, it's he like, ended up dying. Ryan Waller. It's that blind spot where they think that they've got the person. And so it's very hard to convince a police officer that thinks that you're guilty, that you're actually innocent. It took them like leaning in and examining his eye very closely to be like, I think, oh shit, I think this guy's been shot. And so if they would have noticed shot? that earlier, he could he have could he have survived? Probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think Monster. I read that he had uh, he got a really bad infection from it taking so long, and they said if he'd gotten there sooner, they could have prevented it. He, he also was wandering around for two days in his house. Right. I didn't see that, but like, can you imagine getting shot in the head and then being questioned by the police for like committing that crime? I'd be so pissed. Yeah. He also well, that's didn't why really he wasn't, know he was shot. Yeah, he wasn't able to verbalize it because his mm. brain was messed up from the bullet. I don't know, man. I'm yeah. looking at this picture, bro. That's not a that's not a black eye. That's not a black eye. That is a fucking holy shit. There's a hole in his nose, b. Yeah, uh, that's bad police work. That's horrible yep. police work. Agreed. That is dog shit. Look at this man, bro. Look at this man. That is not a black eye, bro. <laughs> that's not a black eye. Yeah. Hell no. Um, and the, uh, the methods of interrogation that they use now, or I'll say this, they're, they're good methods. If the person's guilty of the crime, they're usually pretty effective at getting somebody to confess to a crime, um, if they did it, but they're also good at getting people into a lot of trouble and making confessions to a crime if they didn't do it. So, so they're good at getting confessions. They're good at getting confessions. Yes. So, um, the read technique is what's the most popular technique out there which um, police officers in, I know most of North America use. And what they do is they bring you in and then they, they give you what's called a positive confrontation about the crime. So Billy, let's say that I like you for a murder, right? I sit you down and I, I walk in there and I, first of all, I build rapport with you. So I find out about what's in your background and I start talking about, Oh, Oh, it's Billy, Billy. Uh, what kind of beer do you like, man? I'm a big drinker myself. You like lacrosse? Yeah, cool. We start like bullshitting a little bit. I get you a water, get you a soda, get you a McDonald's. I remember when, um, you remember when the, the kid that shot up the church in South Carolina, the like race oh, war roof. kid? Yeah, the race war kid when he, he killed all those people in the church. There was a lot of stink coming out afterwards because the cops bought him like Burger King and uh, brought that to him as they were interrogating him. The reason why they did that, it's not because they liked the kid or felt sorry for him. It's because in the interrogation process, you try to make somebody as comfortable as possible and build rapport at the start of it so they'll be willing to talk to you. You don't just go in there and like start screaming in their face because they're just going to shut down. I don't think that was people's critiques, though, to be fair. The people's critiques was that he he was taken alive from a scene. He just murdered people rather than shot. That that was the people's critique. It, the, the McDonald's was the cherry on the top, but the critique was how can you just murder somebody and just walk away live versus somebody getting murdered? Did they find him in a McDonald's or is that another shooter? Nah, they didn't find I think they, they, he was in a car. I think no, he went to Ava for, straight from his house. I think no, I'm one shooter. It might've been the Parkland one wandered into a McDonald's after he was done. Yeah. That was Parkland. Was, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's fair. Aaron, like to have a guy that's wanted for mass murder and he's got guns on him. And to approach him in a way that like the cops aren't scared for their lives and yeah. they take him alive. That is, that is strange. But yeah, the, that's, uh, that's that, that was, the, I didn't want to derail your, your point though. I think that's fair. But the, uh, the fast food thing, it's like they try to build rapport. So I bring Billy like a ice cold can of Coors Light, the bluest mountain you've ever seen in your entire life. I bring Can Billy you get a just guy a, drunk in an interrogation? I don't know. You probably can't, but I would bring you a ribeye. Okay. Just unseasoned. Let the meat talk on it. I need to commit more crimes. Yeah, sounds like a pretty good gig. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I would say, listen, I'm not saying a word until there's Zaxby's or whatever here. <laughs> and then when it gets there, say, I'm still not saying a word till my lawyer gets here and you've got free Zaxby's. Yeah, 
that's good. I yeah, I'd be like, that's I want a lawyer. That's actually a good job to pimp a good meal from you. Yeah, I'm not yeah. saying shit until a prime rib where I medium medium is here uh, with a martini glass with the uh, you know infused pineapple vodka. Mm. I'm not saying she's stuffed, stuffed olives, here. maybe. No olives, no olives. So, so we build rapport, Billy, right off the bat, right? Mm-hmm. I bring you big hug, hunk of meat. We start mm-hmm. watching some some game. T- we watch your huddle tape. I start talking about how good you were, how you would, how you ran that dude over. Wow, Billy, you're strong, man. That's awesome. <laughs> and so I, after a little bit, and you know, maybe you're a little bit wary because you're like, oh, it's a cop talking to me. He's trying to be my friend, but. At the very least, you have a little bit of small talk, a little bit of con- a little bit of um, positive interaction where you're not just like mad at each other. And then after that, you say, well, you're probably wondering why we brought you here. Um, the fact is, like, there's a there's been a crime we've been investigating. And to be frank, uh, every single sign in terms of the evidence and everything around it says that you did it. And then you bring out like a big ass folder that's usually filled with bullshit. So it's like a manila folder that's got tabs, post-it notes on these papers inside. Maybe you've got two of them. Maybe you've got some like DVDs or CDs that you put down, some USB drives you put down. So it looks like you've got a lot of information in front of you. And usually everything the cops have is like, I don't know, maybe one or two pieces of paper in general. But they make it seem like they've got a whole shitload of shit. They put it down in front of you and they're like, we've got all this evidence and we know that you were involved. We just need to know why you did it, how you did it, and we need to know um, basically, yeah, what your what your reasoning was for doing it. And then at that point, if Billy's innocent, he would say, "What would you say, Billy?" Um, but what's the crime? Frank, frankly, okay, <laughs> murder. Uh, no, no, no. Let's say that you stole. What would Billy steal? Beer. Billy stole. Creatine. Billy stole uh, thirty six Coors Lights. And a gallon drum of pure creatine. I'm innocent. Uh, it's, okay, so frankly, we're well past that stage right now of innocent or guilty. We need to know if you've done this before or uh, if this is your first time doing it. Look, how could I carry a hundred gallon okay, drum so, of creatine? Billy, all right, so what I'm hearing right now is you don't think that you're strong? Well, I'd need like a truck. So right now, Billy's just like talking himself into more and more. And then we, then we'd start looking for a truck. <laughs> well, I stole a truck. <laughs> yeah. So Bill, as Billy denies that he did it, if you're innocent, then you just, you won't let them say that. You just interrupt them and you're like, no, listen, Billy, Billy, here's the thing. We know we've got eyewitnesses that were there. We've got surveillance footage that has identified you. We've talked to several people that know you that say that you were not where you told us you were. We know it was you. And then Billy just, he keeps trying to deny it, but the cops won't let you verbalize that because the more somebody gets to verbalize their innocence, the more they start gaining confidence in their own story. And cops don't want you to do that. So they'll interrupt you. They'll talk over you. They'll bring new fake evidence, which they can lie about. And they they do all the time. They, They will straight up say like, we've got video surveillance and we know that it's you. And, um, after a while of, of saying that to you, then they try to get you to minimize the crime that you they, did. They can, they can do that in court as well, which is why Laura would tell you. Uh, so like there was one I was watching, there's one, I don't, I don't want to you, but there's one uh, interrogation I was watching where the dude was absolutely innocent. It was about, he, it was like some um, robbery, armed robbery. And the, do, and, the, and the cop was doing that. He was like, sir, we have we have the video evidence. And so we, we just need the why. Like, why did you do this? And he was like, you have the video evidence? And he was like, he was like yes, we have it. He's like, good, show it to me or watch it. You'll see. It wasn't me. Like, he was like super like, good. Where is it? Yeah. Where is it? So like the basic premise is prove it. Yeah. Fucking prove it. It's all you. I've, prove I've it. seen that guy. And he's like, well, what, what eyewitnesses do you have? Yeah. Yeah, good. Then they should tell you that it wasn't me. I was coming yeah, home from work. It was, it was really dope how he did it too. And and they just keep interrupting and saying like, "No, we listen. We're not here to talk about whether or not you're guilty or innocent. We already know that you're guilty." And uh, our cop, what they'll do is they'll do like a, a fake good cop, bad cop. So somebody will be outside the room. Maybe they don't even exist, but the detective will say, "My boss." is in that next room right now. And he wants me to charge you, Billy, not just with theft of this, but he wants to charge, he wants to charge you with leading a ring of burglaries all across the tri-state area. We're talking New Jersey. We're talking New York. 
We're talking Connecticut. And frankly, there are a couple in Massachusetts that he likes you for too. And he's trying to charge you with a Rico offense where you're the ringleader of yeah, a yeah. massive, massive group of people that steal beer and creatine to give to all their <laughs> bros. And we know we've talked to Dukes, okay? Wait, Dukes, no, Dukes a told fraternity us, isn't a criminal organization. It, it can be under Rico, Billy. And we've talked to Dukes. Dukes has implicated you. And he gave us your whereabouts. He's already said, because he doesn't want to go to prison, he said that under your instruction, he's done some of these things. So I've, I've now I've accused you of a much, much bigger crime than what you initially got brought in for. So, Billy, we could do this one of two ways because um, there are two types of people that would commit a crime like this. There's somebody that fell in with the wrong group and took instruction from somebody else and you got yourself into a situation that you didn't know how to get out of. And you felt like your only option was to steal all this beer. That's one type of person. And frankly, Billy, I've watched your, your college highlights and your high school huddle tape. I don't think that you need that much creatine. You're a strong dude. Like that, I, this doesn't add up for me that you would need, you know, truckloads of creatine. That doesn't seem like the kind of guy you are, Billy. But then maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe you've done a good job convincing me otherwise because the other type of person would be somebody that's a complete, total psychopath that is running a pre-planned out interstate mafia type felony scheme. And I don't think that's you, Billy. I know you, Billy. Like you're a good dude and we all make mistakes. Like honestly, I'll be straight up with you, Billy. If I saw just 36 beers that I could take, I can see how I could f find myself taking that. We all make mistakes. We all do Absolutely. shit like that. We've all done like, stuff like that. I love I drinking beer, I Billy. I love 36 beers in one Billy, sitting. I, Billy, I've, I, I used to steal beer all the time when I was a kid. Okay? Like, it's not that big of a deal. I just need to know if that's the guy that you are or if you're the guy that's running this big organized crime ring. And I hope it's not that one. Because I don't think it's you. Honestly, I don't think it's you. I, I think you know the guy that is, though. Yeah, so I, we could do this a, a couple of different ways, Billy, because my boss is back there. He wants this big, big takedown of like a mafia leader, right? I know why he wants that. I don't want that for you, though, because I think that I know the truth, and that's that you stole this beer and this creatine, and honestly, it's I want to help you. So the best way that you can help yourself and allow me to help you, and I'll be on your side here, is if you just tell me how you took the 36 beers and the creatine, I'm going to take that to my boss and I'm going to take that to the prosecutor. And I'm going to say, hey, this is a good kid and he screwed up and he shouldn't be sentenced to a long term period in jail. I think this should be a slap on the wrist. Like, let's let him out in six months, maybe even four months. Maybe even we just get you straight probation for this. And you don't have to go to jail at all for this, Billy. Uh, but if you're that other guy, that's doing all these crimes. That's a different conversation. And I'm not going to be able to go to bat for you as hard. So the way I see is I can help you, but I need you to tell me exactly how you took those 36 beers and that creatine. Loving this role play. <laughs> Counterpoint. If I was guilty, would I be like, would confessing to be the head of a Rico ring be advantageous because it would be harder to prove because it isn't true? My client would like that stricken from the record. <laughs> <laughs> what if I commit, what if I confess to a way more serious crime? My client would also <laughs> like your offer of no jail time in writing and then we can proceed. Yeah. Of course, in this situation, I would have asked for a lawyer and a prime rib like hours ago, but yeah. uh, like, what if I'm just like, yeah, I am the head of a gigantic sting operation and it couldn't have been me that stole that stuff because I'm too high ranking and yeah. I'm the mastermind. That, like that creatine and beer, that's that's child's play. We're on to steroids and, and heroin. That might actually fuck them up a little bit. Yeah. Really just might have invented a brand new way to to disarm the reason. Just look at the copy. Like, you have no idea how deep this goes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hillary Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> told me I, to steal the creatine. Yeah, I actually, I killed, I oh, killed Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you just confess to like the worst possible, I am El Chapo. That's who you're talking to right now. Uh, I'm the Unabomber too. Uh, it would be, I, I like that strategy, Billy. You're, you're kind of on one today. I appreciate that. Um, but so what would happen? Are you the if, cop or PFT now? Because that no, compliment I'm, was pretty nice. 
No, I'm PFT. Uh, uh, but back to being the cop. Well, let's just reframe real quick. This is not okay. me being the cop. Not me, not me being the cop. This is okay. PFT talking right now. Uh-huh. Um, if you were not guilty of a crime, and this would all take place over the course of like six, eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, they would have you just sitting there stewing in all your emotions. They'd leave the room a few times just to get you alone with your thoughts. And they'd tell you, my boss wants me to arrest you right now and you're going to prison. And the charges that we're looking at are going to be 10 to 15 years in prison because he likes you for running this big scheme. And so we leave the room a couple of times, come back in. And then you're thinking to yourself this whole time, like, I, I can't go to prison for 20 years. They're going to take away my entire life. And I tell you that I don't think that that's you. I think that you're the, you're a small time guy. You made one spur of the moment mistake. I've done it. We've all done it. Hell, if there were 36 beers in front of me right now, I'd probably steal them. I probably would. That's just me being honest, just guys being dudes. And if that's the case, then I'll talk to the prosecutor. I'll talk to my boss and we'll get you a slap on the wrist at that point. And we're looking at five months probation, six months probation, and you can get out of here right now. Over the course of like 12 hours, if you're terrified of going to prison and going to jail that very night, and the alternative is confessing to what you think is like a minimized crime, um, the chances of you confessing to that crime that you did not commit are very, very high. And then I would take that confession, and as a detective, you don't get to determine what the sentence is. That's another thing that they lie to you about. They'll say, oh, it's going to be a slap on the wrist. It could be nothing. They don't control that shit at all. That's the prosecutor. And they're not talking to the prosecutor about how many days in jail you're going to get. They're going to take your confession to stealing this to the prosecutor. If the prosecutor wants to make an example out of you, then they could give you two to five years in prison if they wanted to. So it's not, it's out of that person's hands, but they'll lie to you and they'll say, I'll go to bat for you. They'll also say, I want to give you the opportunity to frame this whole narrative here because before it gets out into the press, I don't want people thinking that you're like a high level sociopath that's doing this thing. This is your one opportunity. If you talk to me right now, this is your one opportunity to control the narrative and to get your message out there, which is also bullshit because it's not like the cop is going to print this up in the newspaper and distribute it. He's just preying on you being psychologically weak right now in a scared position to get you to try to claw back any positive outcome to this interrogation that you can get. So they'll say that they'll be like, I want you to frame this narrative and make sure that we're, we tell the right story about you here, Billy. I'll admit and, it. Yeah. It's I was the appraiser for all of Donald Trump's properties. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I underwrote it's, all the loans. It's um, I, I like the strategy of just overwhelming them with a much, much more serious crime. <laughs> it's pretty good, but I stole the uh, election. And again, you can see how, how this would be, it would be a good technique to use on someone who's guilty. And there's a lot of videos you can watch on people who have done really, really bad shit and they get them to confess to the crime slowly and steadily breaking them down bit by bit by bit until the point where they've got a confession and they're in prison. And that's, that's a good thing that you're able to get somebody off the streets. But we talked about this before. Like, and I remember, I remember, if I remember I was like, it, it was in my algorithm. And so I was watching like, bunches and bunches of these and I so I got really familiar with the read technique and there was this one dude who uh killed his parents and they knew he killed his parents and just slowly they did all those techniques just started weighing on him and they just played on his emotions of you're a good kid you're a good kid you didn't mean to do this you were just frustrated like just hours and hours of that and then he finally broke and he was like yeah and it was like he, he killed him because like he didn't want to go to summer camp or some shit. Like it was some crazy, dog. yeah, like yeah, some wild shit, dog. Yeah, there wild. was there, another one that I watched. Where, but he actually, hold on, this yeah. is this is actually wild, right? This is why it, talk, it talks about prison, and the point of like prison and like recidivism rates and stuff like that. I, I, I it's a small piece of me that believes in humanity that pe- believe people can change because he was like fifteen or sixteen when he did it, and so like now he's like thirty some years old or something like that. And he's like written like these letters and he's like, I know I'm never going to get out. I don't deserve to get out. I, I stole two people that meant the most to me, meant the most of my brothers and sisters. He's like, I deserve everything that I'm getting. And he's just like, but just, he just kind of talks to people about decisions that they make and stuff like So he's like doing like this because he knows he's not going to get out. So he's just like, basically like, 
I'm just growing into the best person that I could possibly from from the decisions that I made. And it was stupid. And it was like it's it, so it was like really like dope to read that. Um, I mean, sad because he's a murderer, you know, but it's it's punishment for that long for for it's it's a wild concept. I understand. I, I get it. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of gray area there, but it, it's it, it makes you think about the recidivism rates in America for, for crimes being done. Um, obviously, I don't think he should get out, but it, it you know, causing a question for other, other things, you know, that people have done, maybe not murder, but, you know, like drug trafficking or, you know, you know, violence like in a nightclub or something like this, stuff like that to where it's like people can change people can people can have you know realizations in in those prisons that can you know lead to a productive uh, citizen mm -hmm. yep um there was a it, it's funny to watch some of the the cops when they're going through these interrogations and they have to try to minimize the crime a little bit and they start saying the most ridiculous shit to the criminal or the person that they they think committed the crime where they put themselves in their shoes and they're like yeah it's not that big a deal come on man like we've all done shit like this there was one detective that was interrogating um, a rapist and he was like looking at pictures of the girl and the detective was like, dude, come on, man. She's hot as shit. Like, of, of course, of course you wanted to fuck her. And but he's like saying this to the guy and the guy's like, yeah, no, you're right. You're right. And then the cop has to like have that interrogation tape come out later of him being like, I, oh, I totally, I totally understand why he did. It's not that bad. Like we're, we're all guys here. Right. We're dudes. I mean, look at this chick. And he has to explain to everybody. Like, I was trying to get a confession out of the guy, and this is part of the step, but you have to sometimes say shit like that in the interrogation, which, again, because they will, like, everything that they've done in the interrogation room is stuff that they've practiced and stuff that they've trained on. And if you're in that chair being interrogated, you're going into this at a huge disadvantage with guys that do this all the time, and this is your first time in that chair, and they're going to steamroll you with with their techniques so shut the fuck up or just be like i want a lawyer i want a lawyer. another simulation lawyer. that would be fun would be interrogation simulation so like after the bank robbery simulation and the car chase simulation when you finally get into the interrogation room there should be another simulation but you have to be guilty of of something or you have to be actually surprised about being thought of as being guilty because the way that they prey on your emotions will fuck you up if you know it's a simulation I don't think it'd be that fun, but we, you would just fuck around with them. Well, remember the bank robbing situ uh, si simulation mm -hmm. that we were talking about? Like an escape room, but a bank robbery? I mean, you would be guilty. But it, like maybe it's like time lapse. Ten years later, you get away with it, but they still question you about bank robbery. Yeah. So you could get away hypothetically. Uh, there's another case of a guy named Marty Tancliffe, and he his parents were murdered at night. And he was found alive in the house and they interrogate him for, I think, 10 hours and they break him down. And he was like, no, I didn't do this. I did not kill my parents. I did not do any of this. And eventually um, the cops told him that his dad woke up and his dad didn't die. Uh, his dad came out of the coma and his dad implicated him and said that he did it, which was a lie. I think his dad was actually dead at that point. Um, but they told him that his dad said that he was the murderer and then this kid marty i think he was 17 at the time he's like well if my dad said that i did it i maybe i maybe i was sleepwalking i slept walked like a couple times in my past that's the only thing i can think of maybe i i slept walked and i thought that somebody was in the house and i shot him and they took his confession he got um, accused of or he got convicted of double murder and then he got out 17 years later after they used DNA evidence to find out who actually did that crime. And there, there was another case where they told, um, I think they told a mother she had just given birth and the kid was found, the kid was found dead, I believe. And um, they thought that she killed it, that she smothered it. And they told her that um, the baby was still alive. And so they tried to minimize it to be like, okay, so just tell us what you did. It's not a big deal. The kids survive, but we might have to call in like child protective services to make sure this doesn't happen again, but it's not like you're a murderer. And then she confessed to doing something. And then they're like, well, your kid's dead. And thank you for the confession. Jeez. So they're like, they're like lie to you. And obviously like if, a, if she actually did that, then this was example of, of the technique being effective and getting her to admit to a crime that she actually did. But also 
you lied to her about her baby being alive at the same time. Well, do you want to hear a really fucked up story from an interrogation room? Yes. December 19th, <laughs> 2003. Uh, so Michael Parham stopped 47 year old Ricardo Alfonso Serna for a traffic violation only to have Serna open fire on him. They then apprehended him. Serna was shot twice in the abdomen. Uh, I don't know if he, the officer died or not. So they took him to headquarters. The guy who shot the cop and one of the police officers gave him a bottle of water and whispered something into his ear and left the room. And then Cerna pulled a 45 caliber handgun from his pants and shot himself in the head in the interrogation room. They don't know if the gun was on him when he went into the interrogation room or if a, the cop who's whispering in his ear slipped the gun in his back in the back of his pants and said you just shot a cop you're you're probably gonna like get killed or like go to jail like there's one bullet in this shoot yourself or not and left the room so they don't know if the cop literally made a guy kill himself in an interrogation room or the guy had the gun on him when he went in hmm. so i'm just trying to put myself in the cop's shoes there i think would, the would other be- cop may have died you think you think they would give a guy that just shot a cop a gun with a bullet in it while they're sitting there? No, yeah. the guy still killed himself in 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 uh, the interrogation room. No, I know, but like but before he had he did the gun that, on him. Yeah. yeah. Would you if you were a cop, would you give a guy that just shot a cop a gun with a bullet in it because you want him to kill himself later? I don't know. It is weird that they didn't find it. <laughs> you don't give know. me that. Well, I yeah, didn't. like imagine I patting down like a, of course a guy who just shot a cop they're gonna pat down and see if he has a gun in his pants. Yeah. So there's a conspiracy that like that he may have gave him the gun with a bullet and been like I'm about to leave this room here's your chance to kill yourself or you can get another charge or something. Mm-hmm. Which is wild. Uh, we were talking about Casey Anthony earlier. Her interrogations are must watch because she is so good at lying. Oh my god, it's it's incredible. I would recommend the Jim Can't Swim. Casey Anthony uh, YouTube video that shows like all these interrogations and she's just making shit up left and right to the cops. And she defeats the cops interrogation methods because she just spits one lie after the other with all these unnecessary details, just overwhelms the cops and she's lying about each and every detail. And then the cops at the end are just like, Casey, you just keep lying to us. I can't trust you because you're a liar. And she never backs down, never backs down from any of it. Um, To this day. To this day, to this very day. But I don't know is all I'm saying. <laughs> you think she's I don't know. I don't know if she's in this. I'm just saying there's I don't know that she's guilty, is all I'm saying. I think it's without a reasonable without a shadow of a doubt, we can't say she's guilty. That's what's the craziest thing about these like murders. Like it takes a lot to convict. Mm-hmm. Which is uh, good for our, you know. Justice Have y'all seen system. what's been coming out about the Idaho case? I've seen a little bit, yeah. yeah it looks yeah. like it's going to be a very interesting trial. What's what's the newest stuff on it? That the So the two roommates that didn't die were texting each other while the, the other roommates were being killed. And um, there's no forced entry into the house. So there's a whole thing about, you know... I, I don't know. I don't want to speculate, but it seems like it's not as open and shut as maybe people thought previously. So I, I remember after it happened, there were a lot of people that were like really mad at the downstairs roommates because one of them saw the killer on the way out right. and didn't confront them. In a situation like that, like you never know how you're going to react in that moment. They were probably terrified, confused. They'd been out all night at a bar, probably kind of half drunk waking up in the middle of the night and they see somebody. You don't know how you're going to react in a situation like that. So to say like, oh, I would have, I would have stopped that guy is total bullshit. And so if you accuse that person of like being in on it just because they didn't take action to like apprehend a stranger with a mask on in the middle of their house in the middle of the night, that seems like that's that's a little – that's out – you don't know what was going through their mind at the time. It seems foolish to do that. But if they, if they were like texting each other about – what were they texting each other about? I don't know if they have the text, but the thinking was that they were asleep and now we know that they were texting each other. Or they may have been like 
in these college type houses, sometimes some roommates are partying way later and you could just be like, oh my God, these guys won't shut up and thinking like party sounds, screaming may kind of sound like each other in when you're drunk at 3 a.m. Yeah. Hmm. I don't see him getting off though. I don't think so. So what you're saying, Big T, is that maybe they they knew what was going on at the time? I don't know. I'd need to look into it more. It's just that people have been making a big deal of the fact that they were texting each other. Yeah. The Reddit I... threads and like the online detectives are like making this whole sort of story up that maybe the other roommates were dealing drugs and like it's it's gotten way too out of control, like for the exact reason why they gave no leads on the case for like four weeks just to make sure that they got the right guy. Yeah, I mean, you can you can try to play armchair detective about the true crime stuff and try to involve yourself in the investigation. But there in this case, there was a lot of shit that the cops knew that they did not want the public to know so that they could catch him. Like literally they accused some random kid who had like pictures of him with a hunting knife when he was hunting and said like, this guy must have done it. He's friends of a friend and he might have been like a former lover and totally did it and like ruined this kid's life. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Anything else we want to talk about with confession? I would also, I, I've done some reading on the, the Chicago black sites as they were called. Um, but that's probably a much longer conversation. There was a report came out like almost 10 years ago about how Chicago police were using uh, warehouses to bring people to and um, do very, very shady things to them during interrogations, like physical abuse, things like that. Um, and that has been under investigation by the Justice Department. But that's a very interesting thing to read about. I think it was on The Guardian. So if you want to read about that, go for it. it, it they would like keep them off the books if they brought them to these warehouses and they'd chain them up, wouldn't process them, abuse them, keeping them like for uh, a full day at a time without being able to sleep, interrogate them more. Uh, actually one person died in one of the interviewed. Yeah. One of the interview rooms, which actually isn't that far from the new office. So Perfect. We, should, we should look into that. Billy, Are we sure that the new office wasn't one of the old warehouses? Uh, no, we're not sure. <laughs> like, Billy, Billy, it could have been one of the warehouses you try to find the smiley face killer at by the new office. Very true. Um, last crazy interrogation room story. Uh, this one dude called Walter Lewis Gaffert III uh, got arrested for child for suspected child pornography. I was going to say that guy's guilty based on his name. Yeah. Uh, they were questioning him and he would kept going on his phone and they're like, dude, what the hell is on your phone? And he was downloading child porn in the interrogation room at the oh exact same God. time he was getting <laughs> interrogated for it. That's insane. And he still uh, pleaded not guilty. <laughs> his, his, pu man, his public defender still pleaded not guilty uh, during the arraignment. How do you even take that case as a public defender? Are you, are you assigned those? I could be wrong. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. Choice. Okay. All right. I mean, really drew the short end of the stick on that one. Right? Louis, I, I'd be like, hey, bro, we pleading guilty. Fuck you. <laughs> I'm, I'm who you get. You're a fucking clown. Shut up. <laughs> Louis C.K. had a fucked up bit about this, but imagine downloading it. Like, what the fuck? Like, this stuff must be like, like, how the hell are you doing it in the police station while you're like, on like getting questioned about that crime you're on their wi-fi so it's yeah. like you're, you're incriminating the police <laughs> he asked for the wi-fi excuse me i was just have wi-fi <laughs> like wh what the fuck all right so we're going to get into our interview here with the lie guy this is going to be an interesting one uh chaps set in actually for this interview because chaps has done some interrogations in his past so here he is at stan b walters the lie guy you can check him out at the com. also admire his uh, YouTube background and his video background. He, this is not his first rodeo, rodeo doing these interviews, and he's got some emojis that'll pop up every now and again. But this is our interview with Walter, excuse me, Stan B. Walters. All right, we welcome on a very special guest to Macrodosing. It's Stan B. Walters, The Lie Guy. You can check him out on thelieguy.com, theliguyacademy.com. Uh, according to your Twitter bio, you are, you are creating innovative interview and interrogation techniques and training experiences for law enforcement, intelligence, and the military. 
So you are the perfect guest for this episode. How about we start just with a, a little bit of your background, Stan? Can you walk us through like how you uh, found yourself in this line of work? Many years ago, about 50 years ago, I was doing investigations and nobody could explain to me how an effective interview. And I was getting lied to and con constantly. I thought, you know, if I'm going to survive as an investigator, I need to learn effectively how to interview suspects, but also interviewing victims and witnesses, because that's where your best information comes from for an investigation uh, from those two sources. And there's been very little training in that area. So I dug into it to kind of train myself, went to a couple of courses, started doing a lot of research. Um, was asked to do a couple of presentations. Folks said, hey, this is great. Can you share it with us? And it just took off as a career. So I've been doing it full time about 41 years now all over the world. All right. Sounds good. And I, I've been fascinated and really interested in uh, in interrogation techniques for uh, just a couple of years. Something sure. that I kind of found myself diving down a wormhole on YouTube and just watching one mm -hmm. right after the other, learning about yep. the read technique and all that stuff. So right. uh, I... I with the the show uh, Blackbird that I've been watching, I'm not sure if you've if you're Black familiar oh, with yeah. that. Uh, but yeah, there's uh, there's a lot of people talking about interrogation. So um, mm -hmm. in terms of false confessions, that's one thing that I've uh, become really interested in recently. Where I I never felt like it was possible to give a false confession. I would always think to myself, if I'm ever accused of a crime and they bring me in, I'm just going to say I didn't do it because I didn't do it, and mm -hmm. nobody would ever be able to convince me otherwise. Um, during a high pressure yeah. interrogation session, um, in your experience, how real are false confessions? How how big of an issue are they? They're significant, and it's a lot on technique. And one thing you hit that most innocent people believe that I can explain it away, and the system will clear me, and they'll put faith in the justice system. But under the right conditions, uh, if you think it's the only way to get out of there and trust the system, you may after hours typically, or some type of uh, manipulation of you, you'll say anything to get out of that situation. And go back when you get a chance and research, you know, of um, Charles Lindbergh's baby being kidnapped, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. 250 people walked in off the street voluntarily and confessed to kidnapping Lindbergh's baby. So the next thing is, how do you know they didn't involve in it? Well, they, they can't give you the facts, but they want to be forever connected with Lindbergh and that name, their name be stuck with them for the rest of history. So that psychologically, those folks are not too tightly wrapped, apparently, uh, but they do occur. Um, most of it has to do with two factors, the interviewer's methodology being very uh, controlling, manipulating, um, a lot of psychological control. And in the length of time interviews go on, and sometimes the background of that person maybe if uh, some history in their background, uh, emotional disability, intellectual, cultural differences, that um, sometimes just to get out of the room and say, okay, you know, it's like you've been in an argument. You say, all right, you're right, whatever, just to end the thing. And they're well yeah. marked as um, high risk for interviewers. And so different techniques can are more likely to cause those incidences than a more narrative information-based technique interesting so is good cop bad cop still a thing or is that just something that they show us on on tv shows <laughs> yeah yeah that's pretty much what they show you on television and uh, one of the things i do in my classes um i take students to prison i've been in 40 prisons visiting visiting <laughs> i should clear that up uh but take students in and i'll spend eight hours working interviewing inmates without any information at all get a chance to practice that methodology and the techniques that are most effective um that's been tested through research and science for other behavioral scientists so it gives them a chance to figure out what's working what's not working what's a better narrative form you know tell me what happened versus what we see a lot of time on television pounding the fist yelling at the guy in his face you know uh god forbid slapping people around that that still happens in other parts of the world that abusive behavior mm -hmm. interesting big t what you got yeah i guess just uh have you ever been what's the have you ever been interrogating somebody certain uh that they had done something and i guess you got fooled 
I would rather err on the getting fooled than putting the wrong person behind bars. Um, I'm trying to dig into my head. I haven't had that yet. It's it will happen because just because I'm I might be blocked out that day. I'm not paying attention. I've not focused on the subject. It's but there are methods that we can use to kind of test to be sure that we do have an accurate statement at the same time. So once you employ those, you got a good fail-safe system to help um, avoid that type of uh, fatality. So you are the lie guy. I would imagine that you are uh, well-versed in knowing whether or not somebody's telling the truth or not. There's one person on this podcast that has been accused of telling a, a lot of white lies uh, pretty much <laughs> constantly. Um, okay. How can you tell? How can you can can you actually tell if somebody's lying to you based on their mannerisms or uh, physical reactions to things? Yeah. Well, good point. And I, I had a feeling that might come up. Body language is the least reliable thing to watch for deception. Absolutely worthless. Um, in empirical studies for it was almost fifty years. It fails. It's just no better than 50-50 chance, like eye contact or the fidgeting or squirming, um, swearing to God, answering questions with questions, things like that. Those have been proven to be very, very unreliable. So it's now white lies. Uh, I'm assuming you're saying things like, uh, what do you think of this haircut? No, that's a haircut, you know. Well, it's or, more like, what? why Why were you late today? Oh, I was uh, I was out entertaining clients at a business meeting. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it, it depends on what's at stake. And that's along the line of social lies. Um, the ones that we worry about, the little white lies, we've all done that. The ones we're worried about are to hide something, to hide something I've done wrong from someone else to finding out. Uh, second, to uh, hype, such as somebody hyping their profile, hyping their resume, saying that they're more talented than they really are. Mm -hmm. or deliberately an attempt to harm someone. That's that's the ones we really worry about. A little white lies and social lies just keep us from clubbing each other to death. It's it's just um, general social protocol. Right. So so what, what are some ways if uh, body language is the least reliable? Because I've always heard somebody covers up their mouth when they talk, if they, mm -hmm. uh, if they you know, adjust themselves in their seat, move around, right. if their eyes look in a certain direction – that can be an indicator of deception. If you're saying that body language is the least reliable, what is a reliable way to tell? It's it's uh, more on the cognitive side. If if we know what a truthful story sounds like, and take for example, because um, I've, I've just put it in, used it in class. Uh, her name was uh, Carly Russell that faked her kidnapping in Hoover, Alabama. Mm -hmm. uh, a classic example. She or, or Jesse Smollett's story. I use that one to demonstrate also. Uh, possible deception. Um, tell me what happened. And there's a sequence that the top areas where people in a story uh, deceive is they'll uh, mess up with time, people, or places. Now, for example, with OJ, where did you go after the recital? Uh, got my car for a while, drove around for a while, tried to find my girlfriend for a while, came back to the house. That's a whole evening that's mm -hmm. all left out. Those are a, a typical type of marker. Um, when I listen to a subject, I listen to what I, for what I call uh, topic targets. Uh, for example, there was a, a kidnapping of alleged kidnapping of a child several years ago that I was working on, and the two parents had a really they they'd woven this story together, but they had miscalculated. It was not something they experienced; they had made it up. And those are easier to break because I know what a truthful story sounds like. And they had an absence of those things. For, for example, one thing they said, the father got up, he said at six o'clock a.m., came downstairs, the baby was missing, they searched for the baby, couldn't find her, they called at seven. Well, I picked up, you know, I said, we need to go talk to him about this you know, hour of search. The apartment was only 400 square feet. Mm -hmm. why would it take you an hour to search 400 square feet for a baby? Mm -hmm. And so when the guy was asked that question, his story starts to fall apart because he thought he had it perfectly memorized and planned. So it's those cognitive mistakes, hearing those and then following up with a question. Now, eye movement, 
is one of the big myths. If you look left and look right, you're lying, has been overwhelmingly disproved. Eye contact's the worst thing to look for. Uh, if you talk about, oh, sweating, if sweating is a lie sign, there's a whole lot of grooms lying their butt off at the altar in their tuxedo taking their wedding vows. Yeah, well, that might be the case. That also might be true. <laughs> Patrick Ewing, world's greatest liar. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I have a question for you about the court system, because like if you're a cop and you're going to a school to detect drunk driving and you have to go through the parts where they look at horizontal gaze and nystagmus, that's how that goes into admissibility for the court system. Right. Do the police officers and detectives that use their courts, is that something that the court would recognize as a, an appropriate source to figure out if a suspect or a witness is lying? Great question. Now, what those guys are doing on, on alcohol and staring at the that's physiologic with the alcohol interference in the nervous system. I cannot get up in court and say, because he said this or didn't say this, that he lied. The court is going to shut me down right away. Because it's the jury's job to decide the credibility of all the statements. What I would, my work is in the investigative side. Uh, for happens, I had some guys ask me a class. I was in um, Aaron's Rogers hometown a couple of weeks ago in Albuquerque. And um, some guys asked me about an old homicide they had to work on. I said, okay, well, ask him these types of questions and listen for those answers. Then you follow up on those sets of answers. Um, so I can guide the investigation, but what I would, I would testify in the court was this is an environment consistent where you would get a false confession or a coerced confession was the method of methodology ethical, um, ethical, mm -hmm. but I can't get up and say you lied because you did this or did not do that. What I would do, I said, and I'll take a subject who lies to me all day long. That's fine. I'll have you tied down so tight in your lie that all I have to do is to prove with other witnesses and forensics that your credibility is no good because you lied to me because here's the proof. That's how you get them. But I yeah. can't testify to deception. It's like hearing hearing details and then asking mm -hmm. one question about right. the details. Right. And then all of a sudden everything collapses and then they start mm -hmm. to panic. Then they, they realize, oh, shit, I'm kind of caught on this one. And exactly. then everything falls down mm -hmm. at that point. When you think about it, lying is a very mentally demanding process it's worse than multitasking trying to do five or six things at once because here's what really happened that's what my mind and body and emotion experienced i memorize the substitute story okay, i come up with that story i have to memorize it now if you ask me a question i wasn't ready for like the timing of the search of the baby i've got to modify that story rememberize it again and I have to watch you, the person interviewing me, to see if you're buying into it and try to control my symptoms. That's seven tracks of information. And mm -hmm. mine can't mine can't uh, handle and manage that. Yeah. yeah. I forgot to turn off my gestures on my Zoom there. Th that's good. Yeah, the balloons. That was a nice touch. Yeah. To it. Especially <laughs> since it was at the end, it was like, boom, yeah. great point. Well, can, yeah. Wait, can you give me, <laughs> give me a thumbs up? Because I think the thumbs up <laughs> The hits thumbs too. up one did it too. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Oh, um, <laughs> Billy, I know you've got all kinds of questions for him about lying. So I'm going to sure. give no. you the floor here. First question. Uh, how'd you get better at lying? If you were to tell a liar, how'd you get better at lying? What would you suggest? You probably, <laughs> you probably be picking an audience that's pretty gullible and gullible in the first place. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so your target audience because it takes two for a lie to work right the liar and the person they're lying to you know you can lie and along that same line we don't believe our own lies there's a name for that it's called psychosis we think our lies working we think we've got people conned okay and the liar who's manipulating you which was what lying is believes that you're not smart enough to catch them so they're already seeing you in a lesser role that they're above you just like uh i train in krav maga and teach self-defense and one of the things we tell is that the guy who attacks you always wants you to think that you're weaker than them that they have more power than you and so you flip that script on them so you do it as an interview the same way so if are you saying that someone who is lying to you already like you should display yourself as at higher intellect so that they think they can't trick you. 
So it's almost their fault if they get lied to. Yeah, if, if you get lied to, uh, it's it's because you bought it. Yeah. Mm. Okay, that's that's good, Billy. Billy's found out a way to turn that on us. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's actually my fault. I'm not taking Billy the blame for that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, it, it, from what I've what I've read on the subject, what I've watched, it seems the old the phrase you uh, you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar, mm -hmm. kind of works a little bit in terms of uh, in the investigative process. So when you're when you're interviewing somebody, and mm -hmm. Um, uh, you, you presume you think that you've got the right person. Uh, right. you, you almost want to make them feel okay to confess to something lesser maybe than what the ultimate charge would be. Is that, is that fair? It, it can be done that way. Yeah. And in that same vein, keep thinking the belief has always been that liars rehearse and practice. Not all of them do. Uh, there was a study where they went to four countries and talk to inmates in all these prisons and ask them when you were going to be interrogated, what did you plan to do? Were you going to, did you practice your lie? Were you going to talk or what? Because it's always thought liars were going to lie. What they learned from it is that the people who talk, they said, if the interviewer showed me respect and would listen to me. Now, the third piece of that is that you're argument, if you will, your persuasive argument has to be logical. If it doesn't make sense, or if you try to, bluffing is the worst thing to do if you're trying to get you know somebody to confess. Mm -hmm. um, my focus more in the interview is not so much confession. How much information can I get? Because once the person confesses, that's, that's the end of the game. You don't look at anything else. So you've seen many cases, they got a confession, but it fails in court. Because they don't have the the evidence to support it. Yeah, I'd rather I take more info. I'll take somebody like I said lies all day long, but the information is how you get your best conviction out of it. So why do people talk to the police? What's the mindset behind somebody that is guilty, but will willingly sit down for an interrogation instead of calling a lawyer and uh, saying I mm -hmm. don't want to answer any questions? Truthful people do the same thing. That they don't. They think they can explain away, but the the liar believes again that uh, they don't have anything on me. I can withstand this. Um, I'm I'm smarter than they are. They can't figure it out. And it's that self belief that they've got the perfect lie until the the interviewer starts asking questions that causes that you know that brain fart you know and it just all collapses on them. It's called cognitive load. Yeah, I would just. I would just always say lawyer, just give me a lawyer because if mm -hmm. they're asking you questions, it's because they don't know the answer to something and they need you to answer it. Right. So, and anything yeah. that you say, they will take selective bits of it. They'll use it against you. And also I think a lot of people don't realize that uh, police officers are allowed to lie to you and they lie to you during the mm -hmm. interrogation process. They say they've got video evidence. They say they've got eyewitnesses that might not exist. They say mm -hmm. that they heard from, you know, your best friend turned you in that sort of thing. And they yeah. put all that pressure on you. And it's totally fine for them to do that. And then that just puts even more pressure on the person being interrogated. I would just yeah. say, no, just, just lawyer, just say one word lawyer. That's it. Yeah. Well, but that's like a Hail Mary play too. There's a risk that the subject will catch you at it in when I'm, I train intel guys in the military and so in law enforcement, and I tell them, I don't lie to a subject because once they catch you on one little thing, you've lost all your credibility. It, it's it's an all or nothing Hail Mary pass. And if it gets intercepted, you're screwed. Yeah. Um, Chaps never, actually never, never. Chaps served in the military and he, he has some experience with you were talking about the handheld lie detectors. Right? Yeah. So in about 2007, 2008, they rolled mm -hmm. out these little devices that were supposed to be on the front lines where we can interview different people that we caught in areas that there was high amounts of IEDs or there was just right. a bunch of action in that area. And we had these devices. I never used one personally, but I, I know of people that have that picked up on lies or what they said was lies and we use that as a, essentially probable cause to detain them and bring them back to different right. um, camps mm -hmm. those devices uh voice stress analyzer mechanisms uh under research have been shown to fail about 50 percent of the time yeah they were terrible they're, they're, yeah <laughs> they're, they're very they're not good at all um something that triggered you made me think of that ah, brain death 
about this. Oh, they got so bad at one point. Do you remember also that Rumsfeld sent a note through Defense Department to ban those because of that problem? Yeah, there was a, a few of those. It wasn't just that handheld device, but also the mm -hmm. retinal scanner scanner that we yeah. always use. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to transition to a different question with technology sure. in your company now. With identifying inconsistencies, one of the main things that you focus on in a story, do you think mm -hmm. that people in your field will start to use AI to basically transcribe the conversation through technology and put that in an AI system and find those inconsistencies so then you can go back into the room with all of them identified? That's an interesting concept. I hadn't thought of it from that form. I don't see why not. Uh, I'm not sure. For truthful stories, you got four elements, context, you have sensory, you have semantic, then you have cognitive. And so if AI can pick up, you know, early signs of pancreatic cancer, um, I was teaching the Cherokee Nation, there's a lot of indigenous women that are being murdered across the country in indigenous tribes. And I mentioned to one investigator, I said, are your records um, documented? Do you have them digitized? And she said, yeah, back to 76. I said, why don't you turn AI loose on it, which fits your question, turn AI loose on so can they find any commonalities with all of these cases? So now we know who we're looking for. So I don't see why AI, at least theoretically, should be able to pick that up. Interesting right. concept. Right. right, because you could put it in in different like research papers, for example, have right. three different research mm -hmm. papers on yeah. the same exact subject, put them all into AI and say, find the inconsistencies and the consistencies and outline that and summarize it. And it'll mm -hmm. do it instantaneously. If you as a, an investigator have to go through hours and hours of interrogation to find those inconsistencies by going mm -hmm. back and forth, one, it right. could really help police departments cut down on the amount of time that they're spending investigating. Mm -hmm. And you would have to, a bit better understanding if that person was lying almost instantly. If you take it, shorten that, because I have to elicit the information from you. So what if AI is listening while I'm interviewing and listening to the subject's answers? Yeah, and that definitely is a thing now already. Yeah. yeah. Where you have meeting and it can take action, like minutes, like you're in Congress, based off your meetings, it'll even do it through Zoom or Google Meet now. Wow. Right, right. That that would be an interesting research project for somebody to do. I'd like to see how that would come out. I hadn't thought about it from that. I was wondering about how long we we're going to have Hollywood with AI would take over all actors and actresses' jobs. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and yeah, but that's yeah. so. Now you don't have an actor that shoots the producer. <laughs> that's right. a good, yeah, that would be nice. Uh, that's a good point, though, chaps. It, it feels like if it's just like a transcript that you could put in, that you could you could mm -hmm. search through that. You, you said something that when you first came on here, I want to dive into a little bit. You said that sure. you do a lot of work with witnesses as well, not just right. uh, suspects. And I've, mm -hmm. I've heard that witness eyewitness testimony can be unreliable, um, depending who you're talking to, depending on mm -hmm. the circumstances around it and, and what they went through during whatever the situation was. Um, right. But uh, it sounds like you have ways of interviewing witnesses that makes it more reliable than just a standard, what did you see, who, what, when, where, why? So could Correct. you unpack that a little bit? Sure. And since Billy's right there, Billy Football, mm -hmm. uh, Woody Hayes said that there's three things can happen with a forward pass during a game, right? It can be dropped, be intercepted, and completed. Okay. Investigators have an impact on the people they're interviewing. They can complicate the interview, make it hard for that victim or witness to talk, interrupting, et cetera. They can contaminate. Uh, one of the things that I ask is, who said it first? Who said the color of the car? Or if you said, did you see the broken taillight? That's contaminating the witness, and they think they should have seen it. Okay, Or you can facilitate. So there's uh, a methodology where you ask, creating a friendly environment, I guess you would say, for victims, witnesses, as traumatized as they were, to give information. And victims and witnesses sometimes leave things out because they don't think it's important. So the a narrative type of interview finds that and helps them uh, unleash that. Uh, interviewing a, a victim of attempted murder, and it was something very interesting going on in the bedroom. And she'd never told the homicide investigators about it. And just the way I asked the question, she told me what was going on. 
And the homicide guys were stunned. They said, you've never told us that before. And she said, I didn't think it was important. And you didn't ask me. So with, to your question, how do you ask questions for something you don't know is there? So mm -hmm. you got to ask a really good narrative form interview, pull that stuff out. And how do you balance that with finding all those different answers and knowing that people have different levels of cognitive abilities, they have different levels of intelligence, they have different mm -hmm. types of mental stressors, different types of mental illnesses, different types of background. How do you right. weave through that just meeting somebody right away? Yeah. Uh, you, just to, most parts, you can pick it up during the opening phase of what we call orientation. There's in-depth study of those about victims and with their limited maybe limited language skills, limited understanding. For example, now kids are a completely different world altogether. They don't understand adult stuff, right? So they would never know how to explain some things. For example, if somebody said, I was meeting with a, a client before I came into work, <clears throat> we, might, <laughs> we mm -hmm. might ask, well, tell me about the meeting, uh, go back, where, we, where were you before you met them at this location? And what were the what was his or her response about this particular point in your pitch and then start asking for those sets of details but everything is always a question instead of a statement you didn't you wouldn't say did you tell them about our new package mm -hmm. what did you tell them and that's a better way to work with victims and witnesses and getting information without complicating or contaminating the interview and who would you say is the, is the greatest of all time who's the goat interrogator <laughs> The lie there guy. is uh, <laughs> no. no. <laughs> You'd be fascinating reading, and they can look at a guy named Hans H A N N S Scharf S C H A R F F. Uh, he was a Luftwaffe interrogator, but he was a salesman and worked in Canada and Western Europe long before he got trapped during the war, and he was interrogating inmates or prisoners, and. He was able to get tons of information without torture, without violence, without threats. Um, he took them on walks. He let them have swimming parties. He his his wife cooked pastries for the prisoners in the Luftwaffe camp. Hmm. Probably the only camp where the guys gained weight. Yeah. And he's considered one of the uh, one of the. He taught here in the U.S. for the U.S. Army CID MP school at Fort Leonard Wood. I've, I've taught there numerous times and. and uh, Army CID school, and he talked to Air Force Seer about his tactics as if I captured your personnel, this is how we get information from them. So he'd be a fascinating read to add one time and take a, a, a dig into and find out about him. Yeah, I know that there was uh, there was some prisoner of war camps that uh, the Allies had at the end of World War II as well, where we mm -hmm. put German officers in mansions and yeah. we treated them like kings and cooked for them. Mm -hmm. They had very comfortable bedrooms and living mm -hmm. arrangements and all that. And we had microphones that were in the rooms. And so then they would get to talking to each other and then they would just kind of freely share what they thought were secrets at the time. And yeah. um, yep. it was just like a much more comfortable environment as mm -hmm. opposed to just, you know, breaking out the car battery and, and hooking it up to them and just, you know, yeah. shocking them. <laughs> and then they're just going to tell you whatever, whatever they think you want to hear. Just stop the shock. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Billy had a question. You had a hand up yeah, there. Yeah, my last question is: uh, Do you believe that with technology progressing, you know, everyone has a phone on them, a piece of a uh, device that tracks, you know, location data, every sort of message? Do you think that the lie will go extinct, or it'll just be used differently? It just be used differently. Will adapt. Mm. Um, there's still the limitations that even I think AI might have, and. It's, it's like the guy who almost gets caught in the burglary. He learns where he messed up and he'll he'll modify it the next time to keep from getting caught. Mm. And, and I think it's just part of the uh, humans, the only ones that create the manipulation and construct. And as long as you've got federal government and entities that are manipulating the hell out of their people all over the world, deception is always going to be around. Huh. Mm -hmm. What yeah. about um, what about the MK Ultra experiments when the CIA was trying to figure out if there's a uh, like a, a lie detector drug or a truth serum, right? Oh, so they try yeah. giving people LSD, try giving them various combinations of drugs. Is there any combination of whether it's alcohol, drugs, prescriptions, things like that, that will make somebody more inclined to tell the truth and break down that barrier? I'm not totally versed in it. I'm a former business partner with CIA for 
50 years. We, we talked about it a lot. There are guys who have trained to learn how to resist that. Uh, and it depends on each, you know, physiological makeup. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a lot of faith in those because then you begin, now you're doing the contaminating the system itself, the thought processes of the mind. And now they're going to have trouble distinguishing reality and fantasy and the connective tissue with the story. It might make them lie more without them even knowing about it because they get confused about the details. Possibly, possibly, yeah. yeah. Or leave stuff out, create right. more gaps. Yeah. What about when somebody says, you mentioned swear to God earlier. What if somebody's uh, like, I swear on my kids. Is there anything in your mind that's like, whoa, he's, he's, he must be serious. He just swore on his kids. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, think of manipulation in two areas. There's denial, which is the, the real hardcore lying, memory lapses, trust me, believe me. Um, but then on the other side, how did, how did Howard Wallace's mom manipulate him to get him to do something? Emotional manipulation. So swearing to God, um, I'm a good Christian. I went to church. Uh, I'm a good citizen. I'm a good parent. Never harm my kids. They're now trying to get you to buy into it through emotion and are manipulating emotionally. So still emo a manipulation of the of the receiver of the message. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's not deception, but it's trying to get you to change how you feel toward that person. So they got leverage on you, make you feel guilty for even thinking they would do it. Yeah, so it's almost when you hear somebody say that, it's like, hey, you're trying to, you're trying to mess with me now, right? Exactly what they're doing, yeah. And and, and denial and bargaining are the two, uh, sort of in simple categories. If it's too complex, people can't use it. Um, those are the two manipulation points. Denial is a hardcore de deception. That's the work that I was involved with uh, Martha Davis and folks over in uh, John Jay College a bunch of years ago in New York with NYPD, and we were able to separate those cues uh, and that denials were 90 percent of lying we found happened hmm. and then with that separation of cues do you also feel like you have to do that in your personal life as a transition i was i'm a dog handler by trade and so when mm -hmm. i see dogs acting the fool out in public it makes me think like i need to say something but i have to stop myself and remind myself that that's none of my business do you do that with kids or a spouse <laughs> or anything like that you have to turn it off so it doesn't drive you crazy yeah, you know, drive you nuts, or or everybody's gonna be lying to you, you know? right? Uh, <laughs> I've also told students, first of all, don't go home and use this on a spouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I'm tired of being named in divorce suits. First of all, <laughs> <laughs> second, uh, be careful of doing the using it on your friends, or you'll be drinking alone. That leads to alcoholism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but your but your children are fair game. Use it on them all you want. <laughs> you can always make another one look just like them if you have to. Right? True. Yeah. Big T, what you got? What's the what's the best and or worst lies someone's ever told you? Those could be the same or different, I guess. Same word. Um, <laughs> I was just thinking of um, of of two killers, and one I caught, and I was able to leverage him. The fact that a child had died in the attack, and once. I started talking to him personally, you know, Danny, okay, what's going on? Okay, we need to talk about this. And I just waited on him. And the fact that the child got killed in the attack, and I played on that, he opened up. The guy who wound up being a serial killer, he was killing from Wyoming all the way over to Florida. Uh, they executed him in Texas about five years ago. He was kidnapping, killing women. Um, the other ones was, was the kidnapping where the parents kept insisting that Somebody had stolen their child. Well, the mom had been neglecting the child uh, and the children. And the child, the dad came home from maneuvers. And they he found the child dead in the bed from starvation and dehydration because mom neglected the child. And she keeps telling that same story. Now, that's what it was that it was. And it's, again, like, in my opinion, with Smollett, he still insists that's a genuine story, despite the forensic evidence that shows otherwise. Yeah, so and you don't believe Susan Smith, all those guys. Yeah, you, oh, you don't believe Jesse Smollett officially. I was yelling at yelling at the television when I saw that. <laughs> when it first happened, you could tell. When I heard him talking to Robin, uh, is it Robin Roberts? Yeah, on ABC, and listening to that story, um, Amita got to tell that was not a victim's true story, and it, and there was major parts of it that are left out that. 
were the connective tissue. Uh, I've got an inmate that we use to teach in class. This is what a truthful story looks like. Uh, he committed a, a homicide nine years prior and had never confessed, but confessed when we were using him in a practice session in prison. And I, uh, we went back and checked that the whole story is the truth of him killing this, this uh, school friend of his. So you listen to that truthful story from nine years. He's even describing hearing the body hit the floor, the muzzle flash. You can see the guy moving. He can hear the guy groaning all that and you can see him actually looking like he's in the room living it again then you compare that to smollett who's only been six weeks prior but supposedly attacked by two guys and if it, his story falls totally apart yeah um can i can i tell you the best lie i ever told sure okay and try to poke a hole in this one it, I, it was my freshman year of college uh -huh. i had a test i had a test in my math class that i was taking i was uh -huh. not prepared for it whatsoever Hadn't done any studying. I emailed my professor about two hours before the test. And I said, I can't make it to the test. I got sprayed by a skunk. <laughs> what are you going to say to that? What are you going to say to that? Pretty good. And, and, and then she's yeah. like, oh, are, is everything okay? And I was like, yeah, it's fine. I, I got to go to Walmart and buy a bunch of tomato juice and, and clean myself off. But I'm, I can't go anywhere, really. <laughs> and so I, I got out of that math test. It was the perfect lie. For that situation, yeah, but... <laughs> but you should ask her <laughs> if a buddy of mine's professor at Eastern Kentucky University. He said he could cause more heartache and disaster on campus by saying two things. The exam will be and the term paper will be due mm -hmm. and dogs will die. Cars get stolen. Laptops don't work. Boyfriends and girlfriends break up. Members of the family are in danger of dying again for the second mm -hmm. or third yep. time. The whole can. <laughs> so I'm so I guess she didn't want to fool with it or she just bought into it unless there's a, a rage of skunks that was out in a campus lately. I don't know. There were a couple skunks <laughs> running around. So I, I had identified oh, okay. skunks on campus. And I, I put that in the back of yeah. my head. I was like, that could be some useful information that I can retain later. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing she could do is call me on my bluff and be like, no, come on, let me smell you. But I don't think I don't think you come over to my house and stink it up. Right. Yeah, that'll work. Yeah, that would be awesome. Then you have to go buy the skunk spray from like Bass Pro. Then I got to go hunting for a skunk <laughs> yeah. and like try to get Let's sprayed see. by one. Yeah. If I commit a murder, I'm going to say I couldn't be there. I was sprayed by a skunk. <laughs> yeah. It's a good one. Feel free to use that. Yeah. I mean, I'm not advocating lying to your professors because they oh, deal sure, with, sure. with a lot of crap. Sure. But um, I, I am saying if you do need a good excuse. Sprayed by a skunk, it seems to play. Yeah. That was and, a good one. Yeah. I was probably the your, first time I ever heard it. Yep. And with your example of somebody knowing all the details and he's talking about the body hitting the floor and what that sounded like, how do you work with like post traumatic suppression where you have big events, life events that's something that mm -hmm. typically the brain wants to remove? Like, for instance, mm -hmm. on some terrible things that I've been through, there's gaps if I tell sure. the story about what's going on because the details all kind of flood together. Is post-traumatic right. suppression something that you have to deal with as well? You can, yes. And there are uh, research on how to work with post-traumatic stress or very traumatized individuals. And one methodology that has been successful is to help you turn the emotion off and start looking at things clinically. And one method of doing that is going through things in reverse order. Um, there was a study where they did, I think it was 12 to 1400 rape victims. And, and, you, and you can obviously imagine the trauma that they've gone through. And they found to help them when they went forward, the emotion, like you're talking about, it overwhelms you. Mm -hmm. But when they found they had to go back and think clinically, what was happening right before that? Okay. How did you get to that point? They were able to work through that repressive segment. So it's almost uh, like an and unlocking. Get, it's interesting. Yeah. The, the repression is not totally forgotten. It's just it won't go away. And you, your brain systematically new consciously avoid stimuli that reminds you of that because it is so traumatic. Hmm. Yeah. So they, um, they worked quite a bit. Go ahead. No, I was, I was going to bring it back to uh, the read technique again, because that's that's one that I've I've become fascinated mm -hmm. with. And I know that that's one of the uh, more common techniques that are used now in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Um, is that the predominant one in the United States right now, or are there uh, different schools of thought? Are there competing uh, instructors or competing uh, just ideas of which will make for the easier, more truthful confession? Yeah. 
the methodology behind the read technique is under a significant scientific assault. Um, there are some countries that prohibit the use of that type of methodology in that country because it does get confessions, but they've sent extremely high correlation of false confessions and contaminated statements. That's what the empirical evidence is showing. Um, and it focuses a great deal on body language. Think of think of three schools of thought. If if you were going to investigate uh, a company that you thought was manipulating the books or whatever, and you were a forensic accountant, and you went to the computer and you opened up and you saw they were using Windows XP, what would you think? They're a little out of date. Uh, yeah, that is the argument of what's happening with the methodology. Um, thinking now that there's version one, version two, version three, version 3.5. We're at the version 3.5. Uh, scientifically, there's still people working at version one and two. Mm -hmm. So where are we at and now? It, what, what What is, can you just explain um, what the difference is between the version 1.0 and the okay. version 3.5 that people are using yeah. uh, more often one, now? 1.0 is uh is all body language issue arm crossing leg crossing fidgeting bad eye contact squirming sweating crossing arms and legs that's all been scientifically disproven but it's still being taught as a viable methodology now what happens once i decide well he's cross and and this is also used in traffic stops there's problems well he wouldn't look at me so he's lying now i have this mindset that everything's a lie so I've got this confirmation bias going on. So that level one process began to fall into disfavor around 1984 when interviewing transitioned to cognitive interview. And that's the approach we were talking about in dealing with rape victims and witnesses, focusing on that. That'd be the 2.0. The three is where we are now is what's called reality monitoring and 3.5 would be truth verification. People are better at knowing what a truthful story sounds like than deception. And they're finding that this truth verification where we are now is running about 90% accurate for people who are trained in it. Hmm. All right. Well, I've always said so that it's, it's just a transition. If, if you were yeah. a, a psychiatrist or a psychologist and you wanted somebody to open up to you, just start playing catch up, just like throwing a ball back and forth. And a lot of people get more comfortable if they're busy, if they're mm -hmm. uh, doing something that's, you know, they're uh, engaged in a physical activity and it opens up their brain a little bit and makes them more comfortable speaking. Is there any school of thought in interrogations where it's like, okay, get somebody moving around kinetically and that might translate to a more uh, complete or truthful interrogation? I haven't seen that, but that's an interesting hypothesis. I can see why on two or three different levels, putting the person more at ease and it's not a threat level environment. Yeah. Um, what, what comes to mind is I had to interview an inmate who was accused of molesting kids. It was Eastern Tennessee. And the day before he fought the cops when they were in Miranda. They fought him into the car. They fought him in the car. They fought him to jail. He fought him in the sally port, and he fought the sheriff's deputies in the jail. So the next morning, I said, can you talk to him? I'm thinking, why am I so lucky? <laughs> so this guy, and he was a biker. So the, at 6 o'clock, I hit the jail, and it was dinner time. And the guy came in. I said, I, I'm sorry, did you get a chance to eat? It's not like a cruise ship. You know, you can eat any time you want. Did you get dinner? He said, yeah, I was just beans and cornbread. When we said just beans and cornbread, I said, well, you don't like beans and cornbread? He said, I like beans. I said, what was wrong with him? He said, the damn things were hard. They didn't cook them. I said, how could you screw up cooking a pot of beans? He said, well, they could just soak them, cook them for an hour. I said, yeah, I know. I cook them all the time. But they'd give you some chow chow or something. He said, no, it just, I said, well, I eat salt and pepper, but you had cornbread. So you had, he said, it was doughy. I said, my God, are we in the South? Mm -hmm. How, in this, about 20 minutes, we cooked. Within 90 minutes, they gave up to me that he molested three children in the government housing complex. Hmm. So I just used that as it. So it's along the same thought line that you have. That's building that connection 
as opposed to adversarial, but to keep the person engaged and treat them with respect, no matter what they've done, and then give them a chance to talk, tell their version. Because you can't tell people they've done something wrong, even the bad guys. Because in their minds, they think what? They're what not I wrong. did, I had every right to do what I had to do. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking so about... Reach out. There's a play therapy for kids. So if mm -hmm. a kid has a hard mm -hmm. time opening up about something, yeah. give them some blocks, give them some balls to throw around to play with. And then all of a sudden they'll right. start talking about their, their problems. I think Chaps and I might have just revolutionized uh, the future of interrogations really between throwing a football great, around great and getting idea. AI yeah. involved. Yeah. yeah. An AI football is what you really need. <laughs> it sounds you your CID. Is that what you did before this company? Before you were the lie guy? Were you in CID? Were you active no, duty I, military? No. In in college, I worked. Uh, I got my bachelor's, my bachelor's and a master's degree in criminal justice and deviant behavior and so forth. Uh, finishing in college, I worked for the FBI. I was on the complaint desk. I was not an agent, but I took all the complaints coming in at night. So I was used to talking to people on the phone, all kinds of stuff. Um, then I went to work with the old GT Corporation, which is now Verizon. And I did uh, industrial espionage and sabotage of equipment and that type of stuff. So I was already doing all this kind of interviewing. And then I was direct security of a bank. So now I'm doing bank robberies and burglaries and forgeries and sexual harassment and falsification of old records, that kind of stuff. So I was always interviewing. Mm -hmm. And it just, if I started college, I was going to be a research pharmacist. I got a minor in chemistry. So how the hell I got here? <laughs> yeah. The only thing thing i can think of is i loved sherlock holmes and the idea of deductive reasoning that always fascinated me so maybe that's where it came from i don't know it just my career path is not what i thought it would be well it's fascinating did, and uh did we you appreciate ever encounter... yeah. oh you have another one billy all right last uh, question yeah. billy. did you ever encounter someone as you said psychosis where they believe their own lies but it wasn't in a detectable rate where, you know, this person thought uh, they were in some sort of fantasy situation. They thought they were God or something sort of mm -hmm. general psychosis, but the psychosis was so sort of minute that it seemed believable and they were able to go uh, without anyone detecting their lie. It, it'll leak out uh, eventually because, and I have, I have an advantage too. Uh, mm -hmm. my step grandmother, my mom's mother died when she was young was paranoid schizophrenic. And back in the 60s, they put all the mentally ill, put them on the street. Well, my grandmother lived with us for six years. So I live with a paranoid schizophrenic. So I, I can hear it. I can tell. And when you look at the crime scene, you can also tell too. It's just the different way they, they behave on the scene and how they commit the act. So that's not in touch with the reality. Those are one of the ones that fall outside the normal pattern that you can interview. How, how do they differ? Like, what are some of the earmarks you've seen? They'll describe um, grandiose schemes. They'll have special skill sets. My grandmother thought that the sheriff was trying to take all of her property. And so she needed to get a ray gun to kill him. This is in the 60s. Oh. And so, and you go, yeah. okay, grandmother. You know, she thought my aunt, who lived 150 miles away from her, was coming in at night and trying to put drops of poison in her mouth to kill her. So she would sleep with a plastic laundry bag tied over a plastic bag, you know, for like a dry cleaning, would sleep with that overhead so my aunt couldn't poison her. We don't know why she didn't asphyxiate herself. Yeah, it's not it's not really a safe option. No, no, no. So after hearing it in for years when she was in treatment, even still in the, the control of paranoid schizophrenia, somebody's after me and got these special skills and that kind of stuff. It, it pops out pretty quickly if you pick it up. All right. Well, um, I appreciate you joining us. My uh, pleasure. I enjoyed being with you guys. Fantastic looking, been, looking conversation. Forward to it. Yeah. So it's, it's Stan B. Walters. You can check him out, The Lie Guy, theliguy.com. You can, right now, if you're watching on YouTube, he's got all his information up on the screen. I'm going to take the advice that you gave me, and Billy's going to have a much harder time getting away with stuff in the future. Uh, this is <laughs> Billy instantly regrets having you on the show right now. Because we're all that. we're all prepared and ready for whatever he's got. Although he might have a little bit of psychosis, the good kind. Um, but thank you for joining us, Stan. And uh, yeah, hope to talk to you again soon. All right, thanks, guys. All right, that was Stan B. Walters. And um, should we do a voicemail? We got a voicemail.
I ha- I have kind of a crazy voicemail that came through today. Okay, crazy voicemail. This there's be fucking there's crazy. two, and one of them is. This one is kind of interesting. This better be crazy. If it's not, I'm going to be upset. If you guys don't think it's crazy. Is it scary? No, not at all. How's it going, guys? Uh, This is Patrick from Iowa. Uh, Originally from Illinois. Uh, I was just wondering, um, have you ever, especially Arian, have you ever gotten into a romantic relationship with one of your friend's moms? Um, I'm kind of in this uh, predicament, per se, uh, right now. Uh, friends with one of these girls, and her mom is single, and her mom is... A uh, very, you know, spontaneous, attractive woman, spunky woman, a sexy woman. Uh, so I invite her on a date. Um, when I come back from Thanksgiving from school, and she said, yeah. So uh, I was just wondering uh, if you guys did anything like that. Um, what do you thoughts were on that if that's wrong or not uh you guys think you guys are handsome beautiful everything so hot all right peace was i right I think that's a great idea. Yeah, it sounds like you're confident in yourself and you should just go for it and no <laughs> bad consequences or results will come out of this. So what time out? Now, hold on now. I need I need to get some specific straight because I, I think I heard everything, but you know, it's a little muffled over the over the zoom. So he's saying one of his friends who is a girl mm-hmm. has a mother that pressed him or he pressed her. How did that happen? It sounds like he he, he initiated contact. And she received and yes. confirmed. All right. So this is how I would navigate that situation, my brother. I have never done this. Uh, never with somebody's mother who I knew. Um, but it. I think there's two things you have to answer to yourself first. Are you just trying to, you know what I'm saying? Or are you actually interested in the woman and who she is and starting a relationship? Because those are two very different things. If you're just trying to smash, I would say leave it alone, dog. I would say absolutely leave it alone. There's no good that can come from it, period. But if you actually enter, like, you feel like this could be a genuine, valid love interest, like, for real, because I believe in love, I do. Uh, I would ask that girl first before you do this solid and honorable thing to do. You, you ask the lady. You say, hey, man, listen, I know this is weird me and your moms but listen bro i I like her and i want to take her on a date it's going to be weird she probably won't like it she probably might not be your friend after that but it's better than sneaking around her back and if she says no and this is a friend that you love and that you care about y'all's relationship i would honor her request if she says no if that's a friendship that you care about that's how i would navigate it again i've never done that but I think there's honor in, in how you move, maneuver throughout this world. And, uh, you know, I've had a lot of experience on both ends. So, you know, good luck to you, my brother. I hope you do the honorable thing. Ask Shorty first. I would. Um, and honor her request. If she said yes, pursue. But if it's just to smash, I wouldn't even touch it. I would I would say rub one out and rethink your decision. <laughs> I think uh, if, you, if you hear this guy's tone of voice, I'm more inclined to say he just wants to bone. <laughs> that's what it sounded like to me because he sounded like he was asking a question that he knew the answer to yeah. but he needs somebody else to say the answer yeah, he, need, so he, he needs some justification trying to trying to trying to convince himself <laughs> so yeah. yeah so i mean i guess another thing is as much as and i learned this during therapy right as much as you feel like you getting over like it's it's a very like I get like a certain there's an emotional like or I'm just emotional there's a sexual desire that I have when I sleep with older women it just so it does something for me whatever it is I don't know what it is but it does. I just it I, I enjoy it right it's it's a preference of mine uh but just as much as you think it's your preference it very well very 
uh, well may be, it's their preference as well. So there may be older women that love dating younger men because they get the same kind of fix. So as much as you feel like you may be taking advantage or whatever, because I, I had to talk. I was like, yo, I feel like I'm taking advantage of like these older women because I know I'm younger and they, they want to feel that and yada, yada. And she was like, they may be taking advantage of you. You're younger. They want to feel young again. That's, and then I didn't never thought about their perspective from it. So there's also the answer to that into the equation that this 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 older woman might might want to nestle up a young fox to make her feel good about herself. So that that may be into the equation as well. So I, I mean, you gotta you gotta weigh both options. But first and foremost is your relationship is your friendship with the shorty with the young with the younger John whose daughter that is. If you care about that relationship at all, I would absolutely run it by her. It's a good answer. Yeah, it's a good answer. That conversation is gonna be very awkward. If you ask her, <laughs> can I take your mom on a date? You see that? You see that meme where he goes, where your mom's at? Mm? Where your mom's at? <laughs> All right. You know what? You guys you guys are being way too wise. You could just get what you want. Look, cougars are denoted cougar because they're predatory. So you may be the prey <laughs> in the situation, like Arian said, but also – you could just get the sneaky fling with the mom, never tell the daughter, and you and the mom can just have that secret. There's no crime against that. That's if you're a sleazeball, for sure. Well, it no, is. I mean, it's not. I mean, what's what two consenting adults do in their own bedroom is no one else's business, and it's, it's not like. But bro, but bro, if 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 one of the homies did that to my mom, like you, yeah, y'all are grown. Yes, that is y'all's business. But if you did that, if we're friends, dogs, if we friends. Like, and you don't run that shit by me, dog. You an asshole. Well, let's be Straight real. Up. Let's be real. The only reason that this guy and this girl are friends and not like former lovers or current lovers is because she's probably stonewalled them. That let's is the most real. incel shit I have not, ever what? heard from you. What? How do you know? You have no idea the dynamic of the relationship. And you're they assuming could... that she curved him. That's crazy. Well, why would this guy want to fuck her mom? Well, maybe he's not attracted maybe she's to her. beautiful. I don't know. Maybe maybe, maybe yeah. they maybe they were childhood. Well, no, friends no. I mean, like, no. Not? There's maybe tons they, of dynamics. But even even if they're just for, like, yeah, it depends on the relationship. But you could just get it, like, do what you want, and then like keep okay, maintaining the relationship guy, with the daughter. So this guy mentioned that he's in college, and he said he was going to do this uh, over Thanksgiving, I think, which That's presumably means his friend will also be home at the the mom's house. Mm -hmm. If the mom's so open to it. So there's no way that she wouldn't know. Well, th there's ways around that. Yeah, of course. If anything, like, oh, meet me on a on a Tuesday night, uh, the week of Thanksgiving. You know what I'm saying? We'll go out to a nice little dinner. Friend, yeah, there's ways, but but you don't want to do this, my brother. You don't want to sneak around. Like, Dude. it's it's you too young. You too like on it. You know, there's no strings attached for you to be sneaking around. Be honest. No, be upfront. No. There's so many other women you could you could do this with, family. We're but yeah, I, I was on Arian's side until Billy said, like, it could be your little secret that you guys have. See, well, think about that, this. That sounded She'll fun. get mad there at her There is mom. a desire it's in her that. Fault. I, that's a bad, I'm telling you, it's a bad path to go down because I've, 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 also, I've also dabbled in that lane too. Keeping secrets and having a little, it is, it's desirable, it's fun. It's every time you see each other, it's a wink, wink. You know what we're doing when nobody's around. I've been there, <laughs> not with the older one, but I've been there when I've been there. But at the end of the day, it's just better to be honest. So you ain't got to live like that. I'm, well, I'm telling you, no, honest. let's think about it. The, the, I thought about this. <laughs> no, but the daughter and the mother are both adults. If the mother doesn't think you'll damage her relationship with the daughter, it then will. it shouldn't da damage <laughs> yeah. the relationship this with you This is literally the episode of The Office where Michael starts dating <laughs> Pam's yep, mom. Yep, yep. And, <laughs> and he tells Pam... And she flips out. Yeah. So yeah. Well, let's just be real. We don't, like, we don't know the dynamics between the daughter and the mother. We don't know the dynamics between Buddy and the daughter. We don't know the dynamics between anybody. So this could this could possibly break up a mother daughter relationship. We don't right. know. Yeah, that's more I, likely than them getting into a huge. That's breakup. not worth it to get a few no. to rub a few things out. It's not worth it, dog. As, well, how good friends are these people? How we don't no. know. As a as a woman, I don't think that having my guy friend fuck my mom like i don't think in any world is that gonna make my relationship with my mom better right <laughs> right like i don't think there's any upside to that that's fair enough and in like a perverse then, way you might end up in a three-way with Whoa, a mom and a oh, daughter oh, no. what are you talking about what are you how do you 
Well, so he, of all the things, I'm just to saying stop the last saying. thing that you could have said that would made any sense was that. Here, here's well, a question. it could happen. I mean, look, we're, we're this is this situation is not normal by any means. So if anything, I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. I it's think I, as 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 a I young think, man, I have you encountered any of these situations? That we have a describe? we have a you hit song tried. written about it. You haven't tried. Well, there's no, one no, thing I a, know no, 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 no. I'm saying like as a college age male, younger dudes. I'm you. No, as a college age male, were you were you looking into this sort of thing? I I did my thing in college for sure. Right, but <laughs> with this exact situation, have you ever been in this situation? No, because I'm I I like like I said. It's, it's, as an old saying, there's honor amongst thieves, right? So I did my thing, but I I, I never I never backdoored anybody, like especially if it was, you know what I'm saying? Pause. Like, <laughs> <laughs> call me up. I like that. All right. But no, like I I never went behind anybody's back non-sexually. And uh Yes, and, you did. And, and, and you absolutely to, did. I've never have. You probably have, but like in this same, like, let's think about that a I friend knew? of a friend. Billy, did that you call? Is this your voicemail? <laughs> this is literally No, I'm just, I'm just like trying to be contrary and like make a nice like conversation because we could yeah. just be like, oh, respect your friendship. Don't have sex with her mom. But That's like at the same time, this is like, a real have sex with her mom, dude. That. Like this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. You can have plenty of girls who are your friend. <laughs> you can only fuck one of your friend's moms once. Like, come on. Are, what, what is this? <laughs> This We're here to crazy. entertain the people. Fuck her mom, and then call back and tell us about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, hey, don't, all right, don't, don't fuck your friend's mom. Oh, oh, <laughs> Jesus, I think there's a lot of great Christ. points being made on both sides. <laughs> I think it's different if it's your bro's mom. If it's your bro's mom, don't fuck your bro's mom. If if it's your bro's mom, that's against the bro. Code. Never have sex with your bro's mom. But this is an intergen like this is an intergender relationship. There's no bro code. Okay, like, break it down. Okay, okay, what about okay. Friend you code. There, hold on, if you're gonna go there, Mr. Contrarian, take me through the process. What is the difference between the bro code of not fucking your your, your the homie's mom and then your home girl's mom? Like, tell me the difference. What's the difference? Well, you I mean, there's just I think there's uh there's brotherhood. <laughs> And there's <laughs> that's a word for sure. And, and then there's Billy only respects his bros, brotherhood. <laughs> no, like you, like so. Any friend of yours that was a girl, you don't respect her enough. Is that what you're saying? No, yeah, Billy, I'm just saying, like, saying, like, I'm like, it's more fucked up if you fuck your bros, mom. Oh my god! <laughs> but but why? Why though? Hey. I can't describe it. I don't know what it exactly <laughs> it is. It's probably I'm a victim of a systemic gender relations. So <laughs> it just is, I'm just pointing it out. I'm just pointing it out. I'm just like Billy's hate me, but I say of, the truth. His environment. He's grown up in a mass media that devalues. Uh, women overall and so he's just a mouthpiece for all the information he's absorbed right. it's not yes. billy's thoughts this is society that's talking not Billy. Uh, you you can't tell me that <laughs> violating bro code there's a code amongst intergender friends that is different than your bro i think it might be even stickier of a situation that it's intergender yeah. so th i mean there's a chance that somebody has uh <laughs> feelings in that relationship between the guy and yeah. the girl we've all seen when harry met sally if so wait friends, so why'd you get so mad at me when i was like they probably one of them was trying to get with the other like they were just someone stonewalled someone then no, you guys got mad at me no you didn't say you didn't somebody say stonewalled that. somebody you said she has definitely been stonewalling him <laughs> you said she put him in the friend zone right yeah he might i mean he might not which be, is not this, this guy is trying to fuck his friend's mom this isn't a guy who like probably isn't you know what I'm saying? Are you saying that she should have fucked him if she didn't want yeah. him <laughs> fucking her mom? <laughs> All right. This uh, is like one of those things. Of this is like one of those <laughs> yeah. things where like your like your friends like let's say you a guy is friends with a girl and then he hooks up with her friend and she gets mad. Except it's different because it's her mom. Like yo. Like what if a girl tries to fuck your fucking dad? My yeah. Friend and yeah. Fucking my mother are not even in the same stratosphere, dogs. <laughs> also, yeah. also, to Arian's point, like you could. You could actually screw up a mother-daughter relationship for the rest of their lives. Yeah, it sounds like the mother. If the At mother's Thanksgiving. propositioning, yeah, it, Thanksgiving. No yeah, and you gonna fuck up Thanksgiving, don't you? No, <laughs> no. But I'm just saying, if the mother's propositioning up, it, then it's on. a loose. You gonna fuck up Thanksgiving for that girl for the rest of her life? Because now Thanksgiving, she's Trauma. always been attached to her mama. So every Thanksgiving, she got to be reminded that's when my mom fucked Trevor. Imagine, she may have, asked, he he, she may have to, said something to her daughter about this already, and we're just literally, and she may have okayed it. 
I'm having a hard time believing that. Imagine he shows up to Thanksgiving yeah. like holding her mom's hand. <laughs> I kill myself. I kill myself. <laughs> no, he's yeah. he's in the kitchen when yeah. she comes back home. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He oh. starts calling her honey, and then we have he's like, to tell you. James, the night, James the night made before the Thanksgiving. Yeah, made, the night before Thanksgiving. Night. Blackout Wednesday. Yeah. Uh. Uh-uh. Uh. And then he's gonna if even if they do start dating, then then you have to deal with the prospect of your fr- your douchebag friend who's in college 21 being your future stepfather yeah i will Dude, say th- i'm not saying seems... that i'm just saying like have i am a fun have a fun thanksgiving break go back to college pretend like it never happened Let, i'll be toxic if you're fucking your friend's mom you're not pretending that it didn't happen we'll you're just, telling everyone we'll, you know definitely telling the homies it's yeah. gonna get back yeah to but you're going. telling the homies because bro code you know, one of them niggas going to pillow talk with one of they females. They fucking, yeah. I promise you. Yeah, no. Yeah, bro. but so, then. That shit's getting back. And like her mom's mom definitely broke. telling her friend group, hey, yo, I you just think bagged he... me a little 20-year-old. Yeah. Well, do you think she's telling any of them are going to tell her him... daughter? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 100%. Of the friends? Yes. Yeah, because because they probably got a caddy relationship and they get back to them. Well, I'm going to tell, mm-hmm. tell your daughter, you fuck Trevor, whatever his yeah. name is. And with how, telling... good, how good college kids are with their phones. They're gonna do some detective work. Oh this my girl, God. this girl is gonna have like an inkling, and she's gonna do some deep research into you, into your where your locations have been, what yeah. you've been doing during certain times, where your mom has said that she's going at certain <laughs> times. Get big mm-hmm. tea on the face, and she's yeah. gonna find out. Seconds. Yeah, and your mom's your mom's probably trash at phones in general, so she gonna fuck around yep. and get a get a hunch. She's gonna, she gonna find your phone around laying around. She gonna mm-hmm. go through it. You ain't you ain't savvy enough Bro, to not delete the DMs and not delete you, the messages. So mm-hmm. it's gonna be in there. It's a world of trouble, brother. You guys are acting holier than thou. It's like, not. It's yeah, I am. What are you talking just about? Holier than thou. You're in college, like Billy. You over, may have, you'd fuck your friend's mom. Shut yeah, up. Billy, you rank fuck. your top three friends whose moms you want to fuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, bad boy. No, but those are my bros. I'm. I. I I've never thought about them. Like your top that. three friends that female are girls? friends. Yes, I do. Which one of their mothers would you fuck? Um, no comment. But as you've heard my line of thinking, (laughs) it's a different relationship. I think Billy's entire line of thinking boils down to this. It'd be sick. Do it for the story, dude. Like you're calling it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now guess what? There's thousands of people that want to know. Like there's, I don't know how many people listen to this. There's tons of people who want to know the follow up to this story. So guess what, dude? Your assignment is over this Thanksgiving. (laughs) Go get it done and call back and tell us what happened. And if you just do give us a follow up, like, oh, I took Arian's vo- Arian's advice and I did nothing. I respected our relationship. Then, you know, don't call back or don't oh. call in in the first place if call, you're not going to do call, it. I, Billy's mad at you for not <laughs> fucking your friends yeah. for some reason. I, I am no. not, brother. Well, Be Billy, honorable. he already set up the date. So he the set up the date? Ha- Wait, he already yeah, set he it said- up? Well, he said he's he's like said we're gonna do said, it. Yeah, yeah. To when I get back home for Thanksgiving break. And this guy was like stumbling over it. He didn't have like a rehearsed lie, so it's more like believable that this is happening. I think I, I agree with Billy's take that it would be sick and it would be a, a <laughs> cool story and it would feel good as you're doing it. It would feel great, and then afterwards you'd be like, "Wow, that was I can't believe I did that." It'd be fun to have a secret. It'd be fun to do all this stuff. Um, Arian has a much more Sound, sound, and worldly, and <laughs> logical, uh, logical, and mature kind. point of view, yeah. and empathetic Normal. point of view, because <laughs> your actions do have consequences. So if you're going to be like, "Yo, it was sick," though, um, you also have to be prepared to do that, knowing that it'll probably fuck up a lot of relationships, including maybe like ruin a girl's relationship with her mom. Oh. So if you're okay with that, go for it. And this is th- if honestly, the mom this, already said right yes now, this to the is date, a, this then is that like means on Seinfeld, this relationship the battle is already between, blown up. It's a chess match between your brain and your penis that you're going through here. So do you want your penis to win that chess match or is your brain going to win the chess match? Because there's a I think there's a, a morally sound answer to this, which is I think Aaron was probably right. I would never think to like ask a girl like, hey, is it OK if I date your mom? But that's probably the only honorable way through this. Um, but to Billy's point, it would be sick and it would be cool and it'd be rad. And then you get to tell the bros about it. Mm-hmm. But you also have to enter that knowing that you're going to destroy a relationship and you're doing a scumbag thing. The relationship is already destroyed. She said yes to the date. If she actually cared That's, about a relationship with her no, daughter, no, 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 no. she would be like, oh, no, I'm not going to do date one of my daughter's friends out of respect for my daughter. She's the one who's already blown it up. So why are you placing this on the woman? Yeah, the guy asked her, right? Yeah, the guy asked her. 
And she said yes, which she means she could have been like, no, this is wrong, but she but, didn't. So, but what's worse? What's worse, Billy? Like accepting a date in theory a month from now, or like actually banging the guy? Mm-hmm. Going on the date is like because then the the dogs be like, oh my god, you probably did, and then she's like, no, we just went on a date, and then no one has any way of confirming whether they did or didn't, and they assume the worst. No, I'm saying right now. Like they haven't gone on a date yet. She just agreed to it. Yeah, nothing's happened. Yet. Nothing's happened. This so, it's not the relationship's not broken like you said it was a second ago. Well, no, but if he goes on the date and the date happens, but that's not then, what you said a second ago. You said right now at this point, the mom already has already broken. ruined the relationship because she agreed to it. Well, yeah, she agreed to it if she if she means about following through with it. If she said it just to ghost him and just not think about it, yeah, then the that's a whole different story. Yeah, the mom also hasn't gone on the date yet. Yeah, then she could the, also well, she could also change her mind. Maybe right. she yeah, wanted yeah. to do it and then. The closer it gets, she might be like, you know what? This is the wrong thing to do. I'm not going to do it. Mm-hmm. But what you said was it's okay to do it because the mom has already destroyed the relationship with the daughter. By, By even... agreeing to the date. Yeah. But, I, I yeah, disagree with that I because disagree. I think that just agreeing to the date is nowhere near as bad as if she actually fucked the guy. Because we okay. also, don't know, if, but she if can we also don't... don't know if the mom was just like, oh, yeah, sure, honey. Yeah. Yeah, she could also be like, hey, like she could also renege and be like, hey, listen, you know, more exactly. thought of giving yeah. this, you know, it's a complicated situation. It's probably not best for us. To do. So Nothing's right now, yet. the relationship is ruined. It can. Though. Well, yeah, it can be if she actually goes, says yes to the date and fully confirms is what I meant. She also, may this- now, even if she brings it up to her daughter, it might ruin the relationship. Like, hey, do you mind if I go on a date with your friend? Like, I won't if you don't want me to. And then the daughter's like, oh, my God, how dare you even think about this? Then they yeah. get into a fight. Then the relationship's strained. I'm just saying there's a crack already. But what's what's worse, like her having that conversation with her daughter, them getting into a fight and her mom being like, no, I'm not going to do it. And her never following through or her fucking the guy, her daughter finding out and then the relationship. All I'm saying there is, that is I think something to be said though about the mother, though. You know what I'm saying? There's yes, something to be said yes. about the mother that has, <laughs> has agreed to the date without talking or at least checking with me. Like, listen, I have a daughter. You guys are friends. Like, we should run about it. But this is what I said. I, I preface the whole thing with, is this a relationship, a real relationship inquiry, or you just trying to bone? Mm-hmm. We've talked ourselves into me believing that they both just want to fuck. That's I, I we because now the more and more I think about the dynamics, I'm like, Shorty didn't talk to the daughter, Buddy didn't talk to the daughter. I don't know how they cl- how close they are, but it sounds like they just want to get some rocks off. Which, like I said. If you want to go that route, which is fine. If the daughter ever finds out, you fucking you might fuck up Thanksgiving for life. Also, it may be over before it started because we just talked about this for 20 minutes. And so we may have convinced him out of it. Slash, he may send this to all of his friends being like, look at PFT and Arian answer my question. How cool is this? And then they're like, you want to fuck Stacey Tom? <laughs> mm-hmm. also- I will say this seems uh, like a terrible idea, but more voicemails like this this is the Agreed. first something like this that has ever come yeah i want more of these if you have messy stories that you want us to kind of work through advice advice yeah if you want some advice from the mm-hmm. fellas you know what I'm saying, and the ladies yeah let, let us know i, I will I like, be the I like devil on your shoulder though three four seven five six zero zero four zero one if you want like if you have like deep questions like this yeah oh, honey do you want to do one more? Or was that? I think that was good. I yeah, think, you yeah. can't. You can't, can't top that. No also, I mean, that. I can't believe you guys aren't taking my side on this. <laughs> That's crazy. Well, your side is like it would feel good to have sex with your friend's mom, and it, and, <laughs> and it would also her life. it would also be awesome. <laughs> That's your point, and I, mean, I I understand the point. And you know what, Billy, you're not wrong about either one of those two points. Mm-hmm. I mean, it would pro- it would probably be awesome while you were having sex. He's he's and, already and, reached out like it's and, gonna it's bad. No but also, what. you got to think through the consequences of your action. I know that's historically something you've you've struggled with at times. You're getting better. <laughs> we but all this have, is like brother a, Billy. We all have. Yeah, it's a it's a a very clear case of you could do something that would be sweet. Like, would you rob this bank? But you have to go to jail for twenty years. Five years later, I'm just thinking saying about how fun it would be to rob the bank. You've already walked into a bank with the gun on you. You're already committing a little bit of a crime. Are you going to go all the way or just go to jail for bullshit? It's still under your coat. You have every opportunity to walk out that motherfucker. The bank teller back and make an honest deposit. The bank teller (laughs) is the bank teller sees it and is suspicious. 
Yeah, and if you haven't robbed the bank yet, guess what? Your sentence is not going to be as big as if you had said, give me the money. You're still going to be on the police's radar because they're like, who's the guy in the trench coat who walked in? They check the cameras. But your relationship relationship with freedom is going to be (laughs) much more affected if you do rob the bank. It's a shit show already. her relationship with Thanksgiving. Yep. It's a trauma bond. Yeah, Billy, if you walk into it, it's like, well, I, you know what? I bought the gun. <laughs> I bought the gun. You're leaving the gun store. I might as well rob you, the bank now. You bought the <laughs> gun <where> illegally. <laughs> you bought the gun illegally. You are holding a, a permitless gun. You're yeah. committing a crime. Correct. No one knows about it yet, but if they do, yeah. you're in trouble. Yeah. That's, That's the what, same The same way the mom can send, the mom is talk. Like, cor- if you correct, even found, correct. Wait, 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 Billy. I right, let's, let's. Just extend this analogy just like a tiny bit. Just yeah. like zoom out like a millimeter you, on this analogy. Okay, wait, you wait, wait, filed wait, off wait, the wait, cereal. wait, Shut wait, up. wait, all right. So you bought a permanent, a permitless gun. You filed off the serial number. You got, let's just add on to it. You got some hollow point bullets, right? And at that point, if you got arrested for having a permitless gun, would that be more or less prison time? than if you took that gun into a bank, robbed the bank, and then got caught for robbing the bank with the permitless gun that had the bullets in it. Which one would get you more jail time? Well, let me just say, you're going to go to jail anyway, but in one scenario, you got a ton of money in your pocket. Well, I don't think you understand how like recouping the money that you stole would work. So you're, th- you- you're saying, like, oh, what's the difference between one day... And seven thousand days in jail. You're in jail. You're in. You're in jail. It's going to your record. Just how much time you get to not be in society is different. But you might get a couple weeks with a shit ton of money in Mexico, having fun. That's that's yolo. Valid. And guess that's what? Valid. There's no actual jail in this scenario. Just an upset friend who probably isn't your close friend because you're trying to bang their mom. Billy, you you're would be thinking saying about, this if there was a bro, though. And yeah, that's exactly. True. And also, Billy, because that's a about, that's a close bond. You're thinking about this from like, oh, what's the big deal? I might just lose a friend. You're not able to put yourself in the other person's shoes and say, wait, that's a lot of a lot of trauma and a lot of stress on the relationship between a mother and a daughter, and thinking it through from her point of view. You're like, well, who cares if she finds out? Like, we weren't even, I wasn't even banging her anyways. So now I just, like, have one less female friend that I'm not fucking, who cares? <laughs> this is probably a fake voicemail. You know, this has been some great podcasting, guys. Great to go back and forth with you. All right. You're a weirdo, Good back bro. and forth. What? It was a fun <laughs> conversation. More voicemails like that. Love it. All right, guys. We will see you on next Tuesday. Got some big things planned for next week, so stay tuned. Love you guys.